my friend says caffeine's a drug. I said, oh, tell your friend, fuck you. I don't want to be your buddy, but just want a little breakfast. Welcome to Breakfast Punks, a podcast about weird shit, DIY punk and trashy movies. Brought to you by Sham City Roasters and Deadbeat Donuts from Hastings, I'm Siobhan. And I'm Dave, and welcome to episode 31, in which we're talking about the filmmaker, (laughs) pornographer, general weird man, uh, Rinse Dream, (laughs) aka Stephen Sayadian. Sayadian. Uh, And we're also reviewing the film Decline of Western Civilization from 1981. Our first song is from a band called Cosmit. They're from Bristol, and this song is called Keep It Real. It's from their self titled 7 inch released in 2020. So this is Cosmit with Keep It Real. To kick off our new section on this episode, I'm going to just go through a bunch of gigs that are coming up and some various other bits and pieces yeah. that might jump into my mind as I do so. <laughs> I wanted to go through all the Toxic What's It gigs that we've got coming up because there's loads of really exciting things. So, all of them are Hastings based, pretty well, much, hey. I guess. So apologies if you're not in Hastings, but hey. Or, don't apologise, just come to Hastings. You should come to Hastings. Come visit. And here's when... 26th of March, we've got Culture Shock, Pizza Trump, Top Left Club, The Barracks and Comeback Clip at The Pig. Uh, That's going to be fucking banging. Culture Shock are obviously Dick from Subhumans and Sits and Fish. He's banned between those two bands who are fucking banging. Uh, Then in April on the 23rd, we've got Corrupt Vision who we've played on this podcast before. We've got Rash Decision, who we've played on this podcast before. We've got Wife Swap USA, who we haven't played on this podcast before. Ooh. We've got Brazen Hussy, who we have played <laughs> on this podcast before. We've got Dinosaur Skull and Comeback Clip. We've played Dinosaur Skull. Oh, skip one. We've played Dinosaur Skull <laughs> on this podcast before, but we haven't played Comeback Clip. Yet to uh, record. <laughs> uh, that's going to be fucking brilliant. Yeah, that's Saturday the 23rd of April. That's at The Pig as well. And then we've just announced a new one for June the 18th, which is another Saturday. It's also at The Pig. And this one's going to be Kildren, The Sewer Cats, Riviera Kid, Velvet Fist and Comeback Clip. The <laughs> top three of whom we've played on the podcast before. <laughs> Um, so that's going to be fucking brilliant as well. Um, and then last but not least, at the Crypt in Hastings on the 22nd of July, which is a Friday, we've got Bad Breeding, Latige, who are from coming over from France, uh, Spoilers, Weatherspoon's Blood Orgy, 
That sounds fucking cool. Uh, who is members <laughs> of Bobby Funk. Um, and Moron Butler, who we have played on this podcast before. Yes. Or do we play Moron Butler or do we play The Long Knives? We play The really... Long Knives. I don't really... I still haven't quite got my head around. It's the same band, is my understanding. But just maybe slightly different style. I, I really don't know. Yeah, I don't the know. The version that we watched at the Carlisle were bloody banging. And I think that's Moron Butler. Yes. But who knows? Yes. Very good. Let's say no yes, a hundred percent, definitely yes. <laughs> I'm so a hundred percent convinced of what we've just said. <laughs> and then uh, just to give another one, just a quick one. What's it called? Fest 2022. We've just announced a bunch more bands for it. That is on the 23rd to the 25th of September. We've already sold 60 percent of the tickets Jesus for that. Christ. So you really should get in quick because I think the tickets have only been on sale for about a month. Uh, who have we announced? Because I'm just looking at the general so... thing. So we've got the restarts. We've yeah. just announced. We've just announced Incisions. Mm. We've just announced Batwolf. We've just announced Froggy and the Ringes and somebody else. Plot 32! Plot 32. I thought we'd already announced them. Sorry, I was <laughs> confused because I have the full list and I couldn't work out which Ooh, ones we previously and Are you even allowed to announce half of what you're looking at if you've got oh, the full Oh, that's list? certainly not Ooh. for anybody else's ears. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, definitely pick up a ticket for What's It Cool Fest. Uh, that's going to be amazing. And then on a non-Toxic uh, What's It note, we've got a gig coming up on the 5th of March, which is just after this podcast comes out. There's the Leatherettes, Pond Life, the Ducks, This Living Wreck and the Robot Invasion. Uh, that's upstairs at the Carlisle. Uh, this Living Wreck, we have played on this podcast. We have indeed. And the Leatherettes... I have not seen live, but I understand that they're a new band from Hastings, or at least the Hastings area generally, and they play, I've listened to them on Bandcamp and they're banging. Yeah. They play like really lo-fi garage music. They're really cool, I've looked them up too. I can't pretend to know any of the other bands on that. (laughs) Well, we will soon know them. There is another non-Toxic What's It show to talk about as well on the 20th of March. It's going to be at the Piper in St Leonard's, so just down the road from Hastings. Uh, It's been put on by Cloth and Wax the lovely record shop down in St Leonard's, and they're putting on a benefit show in aid of Serbia's Forgotten Paws Animal Rescue, which I believe is where they got their doggies from, Mm -hmm. which is really cool. And it's all um, hardcore bands, apart from us, so Comeback Clitter opening, and then there's bands called Glower, Ordeal, Untold Suffering, No Relief, and Negative Measures. There's bands called... There's bands called, That sounded like you'd never heard music before. I know, my brain just kind of stopped working (laughs) when I was reading out all the bands, but there are so many! So, um, yeah, Yeah. that's going to be going on uh, Sunday the 20th of March at the Piper. And that's been rescheduled, hasn't it? Because it got cancelled because of COVID. Yeah, this was meant to be uh, pre-Christmas, it was uh, sometime in December, so this is the rescheduled show of that, and that's going to be... But don't worry, everyone! Covid's over. Oh yeah, don't worry. As of last week, thanks to Boris, and now finished. now we've just got to worry about getting nuked. Yay! Yay! Nukes and Covid. And on <laughs> on not that uh, subject, a couple of records have come out through Toxic What's It as well. We got the new Attesta 12 inch, which you should definitely check out. That's fucking banging. banging. Botch Toes debut album, which is Dan from Haste, the next Matilda Scoundrels, um, and Knife Club. Knife Club. He's in too many bands. That boy needs to stop. And James Domestic. Oh, yeah. He's in way more bands. Way more bands. Well, I don't think he's bad mouth than him and telling him he's got <laughs> um, Everyone stop what you're doing. <laughs> and then we've just put up pre-orders for a band called Night Vision and their debut album. I think we're probably going to play Night Vision on this podcast in the next couple of episodes. Nice. So check them out. They're fucking brilliant. They're really good. They used to be called Genital Jiggling. <laughs> and genital jiggling were great they put out a split with Jodie Foster that was fucking it's, brilliant um, Night Vision's the one that has uh, I feel like this has an incredibly lovely artwork yes. for it yes yeah it nice. looks kind of like a, I don't know like an 80s yeah. heavy metal album or yeah quite neon but I'm cool not quite sure I like and then just very quickly on a sort of more me note if I may <laughs> uh, Sham City Roasters throughout March is going to have a half price merch sale Ooh. that's a half lie because it's really only t-shirts I'm not half price in the mugs <laughs> 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 but uh 50% off all shirts will be online, by the, I think, by the time this podcast comes out. If it's not online yet, if you go and look and it's full price, don't buy anything. Just hold off a couple of days. It's just because I'm lazy. And also, I have just released a new poetry collection called The Rats Don't Live Here Anymore. And uh, the day before this podcast comes out, I'm going to be doing a live stream, so you will have missed that. But I'm sure you can go onto my Instagram page and watch it if you have any interest in that whatsoever. But yeah, check out uh, Fuck Ballads on Instagram if you have any interest in words. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, he, you could hear you do the spoken word on that video. So even if you're not interested in... Yeah. but well, that, I guess spoken in, word is still words. That includes words. Yeah, yeah. it does, it does. It all does. of its words. It's, it's poetry, dear. It's all <laughs> poetry, dear. Oh. I think that's it. That's... From my roundup. That's the big creative roundup. It's news round for today. <laughs> Cool. Company offers more than $6,000 to smell dog poop for two months. Pardon? Oh, the cat just oh, made the a ca- little meow. <laughs> yeah, the cat's very upset. <laughs> Why are you not smelling my poop? Because it's dog poop, not cat poop. Well, there you go. She's disgusted. Oh, she is. She's going away. Well, yeah, so you heard me right. <laughs> like, <laughs> they are offering more than $6,000. I'll tell you specifically. They are specifically offering $6,685. Surely it should have been 6,666 and then it would have been cool. It would have been cool. Well, (laughs) there's many reasons I'm interested in this. A, that's a lot lot of money to get uh, for smelling some dog poo. Basically, it's a company... Hang on, how long have you got to smell the dog poo? Two months. So basically... So constantly smelling dog poo uh, for two months. You just have to keep some kind of diary on how this food affects the animal's frequency of bowel movements, poop odour... Energy levels, behaviour, sleep patterns, weight and fur condition. This is to use a specific vegan dog food. Right. Um, I don't know if this is raising any alarm bells with you. Is this the spam or This is the company (laughs) that have delivered us shitloads of vegan spam. (laughs) And they've appeared again. Omni... I don't know if we told... Did we tell the vegan spam story on this or on the Patreon episode? Um, Because some people are going to be like, what are these fucking lunatics I'm fairly sure it was on this. For those who... Well, for those who, A, may not have heard this already, and B, if you're the first time you're listening to this, we've got about two years worth of vegan spam in our freezer we worked out, I, I think it's some. about 120 the equivalent of 120 tins it's a lot of spam it's a lot of spam just because I got offered a free sample of it and then the next maybe like a couple of weeks later a targeted advertisement on my Facebook came up for uh, vegan dog food and it was the same brand Omni and, and so I was they like only... shit the bed like we've got this spam in the freezer that's probably not even for us probably should be fed to a doggy I know it is definitely for humans though, it isn't is. it? but I so think... am I right in saying this company purely makes dog food and then they just make this one product for humans this spam I haven't looked into it too much because I'm quite worried but I've definitely heard more about their dog food than I have about any <laughs> uh, food for human consumption right but if you have a dog look up the ability to get signed up for this thing because they're taking applications till the end of March and if you win I say win loosely because you get to smell your dog's it's not, it's not for, for two <laughs> no 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 but it's, they're only offering a couple of people to do this so they're taking applicants because they're paying you so much money to do this mm. and I trust their generosity given how much spam we got given my god to be honest if it's <laughs> the equivalent of that they're going to say they're going to give you six grand but they're actually going to give you six hundred grand <laughs> If the spam is anything to go by, we thought we were going to get two little chunks and we got well, 120 tins. Especially when the like amount they sell is like about a quarter of what we were given and they sell it for like 15 quid. We've got so much spam. And who the fuck wants vegan spam? It's really quite well. For the record, it just tastes a bit like sausage. It's quite nice. It tastes like really salty sausage. It's quite yeah. good. <laughs> but, well, if, if their spam's anything to go by, that dog food's going to be delicious. Um, <laughs> not that we're eating it, not that you get to eat it. But yeah, if you've got a dog, you've got to the end of March to sign up for this and you might get six grand just to smell your dog's poo and you'll get two months worth of dog food. Can I tell you what... For your I... dog, please have a dog if you're doing this. <laughs> please have a dog. <laughs> Can I tell you what I thought you meant when you read out that headline? Oh, gosh. I thought it was that for two months, you have to basically have a dog poo under your nose for the entire <laughs> time. And somehow that was going to be testing something. <laughs> your, your will to live. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that would have been... Very, you would have got very unwell. If you just smelled dog poo. Does it... I mean, I'd be interested to know how much you've got to get your nose in there. Also, surely you've got to have some skills of knowing what... Like, different people will smell different things. It's like saying, eat this food and tell me if it's nice. Well, you're going to get a hundred different answers, aren't you? Well, I feel like this company, as sweet as they are, um, are very, um, I don't know, not as organised in the collecting of their data. Because like I say, we've been given... So much vegan spam, and I got <laughs> I one email. Stress I cannot enough stress how, how much, much spam, spam we've, got. we've got in our freezer. And I think the proviso was that we give feedback on what we use it for, and I haven't done a single thing, and they don't care. Well, no we've put it, we've, me. well for, to the uh, listener at home, we've put it in pasta, delicious. That yeah. went really well. We had it as part uh, of a breakfast. Had it as part of a breakfast. That I made a really, right. I good. made a really good risotto, and then put spam in it. No, a spam risotto it was delicious. <laughs> I don't know if that's in any cookbook, but it was great. <laughs> 
Our um, buddies, Mike and Syl, had Spam and spaghetti hoops, because apparently that's what Syl used to eat and, when she was a kid. And she air fried it. And she air fried it. It looked, very, it looked very good. I would suggest if you have an air fryer, air frying it, because A, a lot of water comes out, mm. and B, it just ruins a pan. Yeah. But, you know, well, they, there, there you, you go. go. Full review of vegan spam like, yeah, for I the know. ladies and gentlemen at home. For Omni, I hope you're listening. <laughs> if not, thanks for the fucking, God knows, <laughs> 50 quid's worth of spam you sent us. <laughs> Which we're still eating. Well, we love a record-breaking attempt oh, on yeah. this uh, podcast. I think I feel like it's been a little while since we talked about one. This man got hit in the face with 92 wet sponges <laughs> in a minute, and therefore he's now in the Guinness Book of Records. Well done. What good boy. Uh, you say good boy. He's a prick. Uh, David Rush has a habit of breaking Guinness World Records regularly, oh. and with the wet sponge achievement, he's broken at least three records in the past few months. At the age of 30... Rush had no Guinness World Records. Oh. Now, 35, he's total of 150. Oh, what a so, knob. For the last five years, this man's wasted his horrible shit life. <laughs> um, for the latest, he employed the help of a neighbour who threw 106 wet sponges at his face. Rush managed to take 96 right in the kisser, and that broke the previous record of 96. No, hold on a second. Well, that doesn't work. He got 96, and it broke the previous record of 96. This is a poorly written article from the Times. Or it's untrue and this boy needs to do it again. Also, not being funny, I could do 96 wet sponges to the face. I will say I don't his... think it's that hard. Right, so well, let me just do a couple of things. There's a video. I will put this on the YouTube playlist. Oh, is he being fired at his face? No, he's not being fired. Okay. He's literally got his neighbour with a, with a big Tupperware full of sponges <laughs> and he's just throwing them. But he is a little way away from him. And I presume there, there's there's lines on the floor, so I'm guessing he has to be like a certain uh, right. distance away from him. Yeah. So it and it's further than you would think. Like it's quite hard. You know that thing if you try and throw a peanut in someone's mouth. Yeah. You'd be there for a long time. Yeah. It's not quite as hard as that, but it's the equivalent of that. But sponges on a face. So sorry, the man who received them in the face has got the world record. What about the neighbour that managed to hit him in the well, face that many times? Yeah, but the man who's taken in the face is having to like duck and dodge and get him in his face. So oh. that's the, if you can imagine it. Like obviously the sponges aren't. They're going a bit random, so he's okay. moving his head around. He looks like he's really taking it seriously. He's not messing around, this Jimbo. I'm quite tempted to do this one. Well, all right, we can do it in the summer, maybe. But one thing that I'm yeah. definitely not going to do is that when you watch this YouTube video, it's 35 minutes long. The first 32 minutes of this prick talking about how wonderful he is and doing his juggling. Uh... <laughs> he's like, I'm going to do a couple of bits for you. Well, he doesn't talk like that because he's American. <laughs> He He's does. He gets his juggling balls out. He does. Trade. He does a bit of juggling for you. He talks about how wonderful he is. He talks about how many different. Um uh, world records he's broken he does a little bit of like positive thinking for all the people oh. at home so that you can really get them ready it's sort of a little bit like probably going to crossfit but with wet sponges <laughs> in with the face. wet sponges i mean all of the things that he's done are because it's completely pointless he's not the one that i read one recently that was a man who's balanced six m&ms on top of each other and that's a guinness world record i can't tell you for certain but it sounds like the sort of shit this man <laughs> does this man put 34 t-shirts on and that was one of them I mean, uh, the person um, who did the M&M's was uh, described as a prolific record breaker. Yeah, it sounds like him. Right? Yeah. I mean, this guy's done 150 in five years. He guzzled a litre of lemon juice in 17 seconds. What a twat. That sounds disgusting. But yeah, watch the video on YouTube. It's, it'll make you feel better about your life. These horrible, pointless, soppy, wet humans throwing soppy wet sponges at each other's faces for no reason whatsoever whilst their children run about screaming uh, it's disgusting but disgusting. i would very much recommend but, it. <laughs> but go and watch it <laughs> well here's something that's not pointless in the slightest pig wanders into working men's club and is lured out by cheese and onion crisps oh that is a headline and a half <laughs> Uh, the pig, believed to be called Roddy, ran around the bar <laughs> hoping to get strokes. <laughs> <laughs> How do they know what he wanted? Maybe he wanted a know. pint. <laughs> I don't know. He wandered in. It was 10pm. He wandered into the Evington Collieria Club. I might have said that wrong. Uh, in County Durham, shortly before closing time. They, he ran around trying to get strokes from the punters. But pigs are not allowed in the venue. And customers managed to lure him outside with cheese and onion crisps until someone cl- arrived to claim him who spotted what was happening on Facebook. <laughs> Does it make it clear what they did with the crisps? Did they do a little line of, like, towards the door? I so think so. One I, I think so. <laughs> I think it is. Bless, it was quite sweet. Um, Kaylee Parkin, 
the bar stewardess. So I live on the premises and I was upstairs and the bar staff to phone me. I'm sorry to disturb you, but there's a pig in the bar. <laughs> Everyone said he's been running around trying to get strokes. So someone got some crisps and lured him outside with the cheese and onion flavour. <laughs> what do you think a pig's favourite crisp flavour would be? I reckon cheese and onion. Do you think you're going like. with just standard cheese and onion? I think because they're the, they're the pongiest ones and I feel like a pig needs a pongy crisp given yeah, um, yeah. that it lives in quite a lot of his own excrement. You'd want to stay away from any bacon. Uh, oh, he can't. The dr- That's cannibalism. Yeah. He, can't have a, he can't have a bacon crisp or a I'm, hammy one. I think a pig would like a crisp sandwich. Oh, he would love a crisp sandwich, yeah. I reckon. Loads of butter on some mighty whitey. Loads and some salt and vinegar. Or maybe, or, I don't real know. Real basic, I like, or just vin- maybe just salt. Maybe salt, but I reckon the cheese, cheese and onion. He should do what I used to do. Um, we used to make Nutella sandwiches and put cheese and onion crisps in them. God, and, that is until, fucking uh, 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 disgusting. Until you've done it, until you've done it. <laughs> Jesus Christ. It was dead nice. I don't know why I ever did it as a kid, but... Um, Nutella, cheese and onion. Would you yeah. put those things together if that wasn't a crisp? No, <laughs> but I loved it. for some reason. I don't know why I ever did it as a kid. Like ready salted crisps make perfect sense in that uh, situation. Cheese and onion. <laughs> they don't make did it perfect. Once. Sense. Yes, it does. That's pushing it a bit. Salt and chocolate is dead good. Mm. Salt and chocolate and potato really good. Uh, cheese and onion crisps. It works. Mm. Don't uh, I don't know why. Mm. But um, no, I don't, I don't think, think the pig would gra- like that. I think the pig would have <gasps> stayed in the bar, waiting for his cheese moments. <laughs> well, that pig sounds a bit like a bit of a hero. He's a hero. And speaking of heroes, oh. there's two involved in this story. Oh. It's a bit old. I was going to do this on the last episode, but because we did our, our Time Cop episode, it's uh, sort of put everything a bit back. So this refers to something that we a little bit that we discussed a whole month ago, Ooh. which is the whole Joe Rogan thing. I'm not oh, going to get into it again. I think I said more than enough about <laughs> it on a previous episode. But Steve Albini. Yay! Loves the Juggalos. Oh, this is one of my favourite stories of the last month. So, Steve Albini has tweeted... I didn't know he was on Twitter. It doesn't strike me as a man who should be on Twitter. But anyway, <laughs> that he's tweeted a quote from Violent J uh, of the Insane Clown Posse. Uh, if you're not sure who Violent J or the Insane Clown Posse are, you should go back and listen to our Juggalo episode. Sorry, Juggalism episode. Juggalism. Which is definitely not the correct word. <laughs> um, and uh, he's talking about his his history of homophobia in his lyrics and uh, I'm going to actually read what he says because it's really nice the amount of gay juggalos out there is really surprising I think about them doing their research and getting the old records getting excited about it and getting their hearts broke or something I tell my daughter for the rest of your life when your friends ask why your dad said that say it's because your dad was a fool don't defend me say I was a fool then but I'm not now there's no excuse I was going with the flow and that's the very thing we preach against, being a sheep. And that's what I was doing. Oh, Violent J. And then Stereo Gum, who was the people that were interviewing him, said, it's so cool to hear you grappling with it, though. And he immediately comes back. It's not cool. It shouldn't even be an issue. We're smarter than that. As juggalos, we're not judgmental. How the fuck could we be juggalos and say that, as in uh, homophobia? It don't make any sense. It's the biggest contradiction you could have. And somehow it just flew for years. It's a terrible thing. Oh, I love it. And uh, Steve Albini has come out and said, this is absolutely model, owning your shit behaviour, and if a goddamn fucking juggalo can manage it, a nine-figure podcaster can step the fuck up without whining. Yeah! Now, I will say this is a bit out of date, because Joe Rogan has kind of stepped the fuck up, and has apologised, but since the last time that we discussed this... A number of other things have come out that on previous episodes, I think it's something, and it's quite a few, it's something like 13 of his episodes, he dropped a number of Mm. N-bombs. They were in the context, and I'm not excusing them in any way, but they were in the context of him repeating what someone else said. Does that make sense? And so he... Uh, he said that he and he, he was quite. I, I I don't have his exact quote, so I might be slightly misquoting him here. But he more or less said that at the time he thought it was all right because he was quoting what someone else had said, i.e., mm. a black person had said something and used that word, and he quoted it. But he now accepts that that was completely inappropriate behaviour. So yeah. he sort of has stepped up, but still he's a prick. But mm-hmm. still a confusing matter. Still don't know whose side I'm on. It didn't really go that far from last time. I mean, I feel like Neil Young's kind of got all the publicity that he needed, so he shut up about it now. 
Um, and like I say, they've now Spotify have taken down a bunch of Joe Rogan podcasts that very specifically have like dodgy material in them, but they haven't like got rid of him or anything. And he's still um, he's still being allowed to make his podcast, which in a lot of ways I kind of think that's probably the right thing to have done. Yeah, that's probably uh, that's probably about as far as you could take it. That's not censorship because they're still giving him a platform. Yeah. But they're acknowledging that you can't just say anything that you want, and so they will take it down. And I will say that since this has all come out, and I don't know how much this makes any fucking difference whatsoever, but we obviously post our podcast on Spotify. And now when you post your podcast onto Spotify, you have to agree to a bunch of principles. Oh, okay. And say that you haven't done this, that, or the other. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's something. It's something. But yeah, Steve Albini basically says... He's saying the Juggalos are good, a non-judgmental, inclusive community for people on the fringe, built on a beautiful communion they call family. They remind me of punk, queer, chosen families, and I love them. And I haven't heard much of their music. It's atrocious, but who cares? (laughs) That's basically exactly how I feel. He also says they're less annoying than deadheads. Um, and there's way less lawyers and CEOs (laughs) involved, which I quite like. What's deadheads? Uh, people that like the Grateful Dead. Like uh, hippie, hippies, hippies. Oh, okay. Mm. He said, a lot of jugglos are dumb slash laughable, but so what? Your life isn't? <laughs> Get over <laughs> yourself. The part that matters to them, uh, that they are there for each other in material ways other communities fail at, that's the whole thing. Oh. I couldn't agree with him more. Why Steve gosh. Albini's really stood up recently. He uh, He's acknowledged like his own really dodgy behaviour from the past, and he's mm. really um, a, a, good, a good man. It's interesting because uh, he's obviously... I wonder how difficult he is in uh, real life nowadays because I think all of the like footage and interviews I've seen of him are probably a bit prior to this time. Yeah. And he definitely comes off as quite difficult. I, I can't imagine a uh, well I can imagine him being as right on as this. I just can't imagine what it sounds like from his mouth. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, not no, being horrible because he's never he's not he's not I, I'm being quite harsh, I think, and I, I have limited knowledge of him, but just some of the footage from him talking in some of the documentaries that he was in that were probably filmed in the early 2000s-ish, yeah. where he's quite, you know, I'm unlikable and I don't care. I, but I don't think that he's necessarily any different to that. Now. Yeah. I mean, being difficult isn't a bad thing. No. I mean, I think we sometimes just presume that it is, but it isn't. You can, I think, you know, it, anybody that's questioning... Um, anything, particularly anything remotely important, is potentially quite difficult. Yeah, you know. So I think that he, I think that he probably, you know, he's still difficult. But the thing is, is that he had this persona, and we're talking about in the early eighties, mid eighties. He had this persona of basically he his opinion at that time, which went along with a lot. And we'll talk about this probably a little bit about decline of Western civilization later. His mm. opinion was you should be able to say whatever you want, and that it's stupid not to say things out loud because if you think a thought that is whatever yeah. sexist homophobic whatever and you don't say it out loud you're and I'm kind of I'm kind of filling in the gaps a little bit but you're kind of not being true to yourself mm. and there was sort of an you know there was something about punk where it was kind of like anything goes now and in a yeah. way you can see that society needed that I think at that time like going back to what we were talking about last episode yeah. about 1974 how kind of safe everything was in a lot of ways yeah. particularly in the mainstream that's what initially punk did but then it's grown and it's and community has changed and uh, yeah. society rather has changed and so he's now learned and grown yeah and looks back on his past behavior i mean he's someone who was in a band called rape man mm. and that was based on a Japanese comic, you know, so it was kind of like just the name of his favourite comic, although if your favourite comic is Rape Man, then I don't know what that says about you. But, mm. I mean, that's a very well-known... Like, I think it's a manga and there's, like, films and all sorts of stuff. I've never seen it or don't really know anything about it, but I know it's quite a big, like, title. Mm. Um, but he felt that that was, at the time, it was like, we want to be as shocking as we possibly can. Yeah. And that's as about as shocking as you can possibly be. But, of course, it's not thinking about the bigger picture and the you know rape it's not thinking about that is it it's just it's just like we're going to be shocking and it's the same as like the sex pistols wearing um swastikas yeah you know at the time it was seen as they weren't necessarily they weren't racists they weren't nazis necessarily i'm sure some of those punks were but yeah for the majority of the time they weren't and actually they were singing more or less although it was more complex than this they were more or less singing against that sort of thing but, but they that were was the most offensive thing you to, could yeah, do. Yeah, because it was just, here's a symbol. But it yeah. was, again, I do think that the attitude was, if you're going to be shocked by an armband, then you're an idiot. Yeah. 
Yeah. But we've changed, haven't we? We've, you know, society's changed. So well done, yeah. Steve Albini. Well done, Violent J. Violent J's. I was going to say the best, but he's not. Definitely not the best. No, but I think he maybe he's coming around to being better. And well, these maybe not extorting all... all of his juggalos anymore. Yeah, well, no, I'm sure he's doing <clears> that. I mean, there's no question about that. But, um, <laughs> but I mean, all of these people are older as well, aren't they? And they're all parents. And I mean, you know, I'm mm. sure all of this stuff just like changes you a bit. Like you do stupid things when you're young. And this is another reason why cancel culture is so difficult to get your head around because yeah. people can change. Yeah. So if you're if you do something when you're 20 and then you're thrown out of society, yeah. then you can never get better. It's only going to take you down a, a journey where you're just going to be bitter and yeah. any bad thing about your personality is only going to get worse and worse. Yeah, I think like Steve Albini has pretty much stated it better than we could, I think Violent J's done the absolute most model version of yeah. owning his shit. Yeah. I think that's he's exactly right. Owning your shit is like a really important thing. It's like, yeah, yeah I, I wasn't always perfect. I'm not perfect. And then when the people doing the interview are like, "Oh, it's really cool that you're grappling with this," and he's like, "No, it's not cool. Yeah, like, it you don't need be, to. You don't need to exist. say that this yeah. is okay. I'm stating that it's not okay, and I am so aware of that. Mm. And now I'm going to be better." But I was I'm quite not surprised by away that, from it. that bit. I was quite surprised by because I will say, out of <laughs> everything that I know about Violin J, he's a lot of things, but one of them is definitely he's thick as shit. So I don't know how he came back with. <laughs> So quickly with that, he must have you know, <laughs> he must have had that prepped or something. I'm not really sure. I don't know. That, oh, he's just really, him. really feeling it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mate, I don't know what it feels like to have a daughter that is, you know, upset with you. But yeah, it must fucking hurt. So I think that's the thing, isn't it? It's not, there's nothing intellectual about Juggalo. So what they say, or not all, that's unfair. There's yeah. nothing intellectual about the culture, and there's nothing intellectual about insane clown pussy. So if they say something which is right, you know it's what they mean it's just like it's fallen out of their mouth because yeah. that's how they feel yeah i think i think yeah. that's fair that's a really generalized statement i think it's fair whoop, whoop. Oh, oh, whoop, whoop. well speaking of uh oh, i don't know i feel like a juggalo would probably have no problems with this person and mm. nor do i oh. good on this man man sexually attracted to balloons has fifty thousand in his house no. <laughs> um he has opened up for about his love of balloons julius has had an obsession with balloons since he was just four when his mum brought him one in hospital. I feel like this is oh. going to... Uh, don't want to get into the Freud shit no, there. but not. Yeah, let's, uh, let's not... Let's I feel not, like that will darken this story. Let's not unpack that too much. <laughs> um, but for five decades since then, he's been addicted to them so much he's got a balloon sanctuary in his house packed with thousands of balloons, which is where he sleeps every night. He says that they're beautiful, they're soft, smooth, delicate. I have a connection with them. Intellectually, I know that balloons are not alive, but sometimes I wonder if it's my love for them that brings them to life. Aww. And his love is not just platonic. Far from it. Is he fucking the balloons? Uh, well, it doesn't... I mean... I mean, yes, hear, he is. Hear this, don't, don't. hear this and make with it what you will. My love for balloons, it is also sexual. When I see a beautiful balloon, my heart starts to flutter and I get aroused. I'll take a 12-inch and inflate it to 11-inch, and that way it can take a lot of abuse. Oh, that means it can only take one inch. <laughs> That means he's given himself away there a little bit, hasn't he? <laughs> I mean, that's, isn't that I, the worst thing you can say about your uh, own penis? I, I make a little space that's exactly an inch, and then well, I go to town. I don't know. I don't because if you inflate it, to, you've still got to tie it up so that you're not inserting anything into this balloon. Oh, he's just rotten the out out. Yeah, yeah that must and it's pop. not full, well. No, because he doesn't blow up the whole way. That's no, what he's saying. No, but still, if you're going on a balloon, <laughs> it doesn't. Even if it's halfway up, it's going to pop if you really well, <laughs> if you really get carried away. I mean, here's Jack a bit, hammering it. Here's <laughs> Jack hammering a balloon. I mean, here's a bit of detail. I'm holding one, you know, hugging it. I'll kiss it, and it's like being in heaven. I mean, don't you like hugging and kissing a woman that you love? And uh, well, if you're wondering if he has a woman. Yes, he does. Oh, my God. He goes, my wife thinks it's strange, but she just accepts it, slash has affairs. So does she uh, have 50,000 balloons in her, or 30, whatever it was, in her, in her house as well? I mean, they must live together, that's I guess. The only, that's the only mention of the wife. I mean, fuck knows where in this house. I, th- I think he just drops that in to be like, I am real, I'm a human being, I am normal. Do you think his wife is like a banana? A banana? Do you think his <laughs> wife is a um, balloon person? Do you think he's made her out? Oh, of just do you balloons? think the wife's real? Just sticking, I mean, he doesn't give a name because you can get those long ones that clowns yeah. blow. They can be the arms and legs. Oh, you gosh. can get yeah. You can probably get them all different. Just draw a little smiley face on it. Do you think his and wife then is just fuck it? 
<laughs> fuck the shit out of that balloon. A bit like in, uh, is it Cast Away, where he's got a friend that is a um, volleyball or something? Yeah. A bit like that. But except he's on except a desert he island. It. And, <laughs> and in his he spends many years there until he goes mad and then starts talking to a rock or whatever it is. This guy's got ample opportunity to have conversations and relationships with all sorts of different people, but he chooses a balloon. Well, I mean, he doesn't just have fuck them. His love for balloons is so strong that he often spends days rescuing balloons that he believes to be in danger. <laughs> he said, I go to car dealerships and do what I call a balloon rescue. <laughs> when they set them out early in the morning, they're really beautiful. And as the sun bakes on them, they get really dull and misshapen. I feel like I give them a second chance at life. Despite concern among his family, Julius says he has no plans to end his love affair with balloons. He says, I've seen a psychologist before, and the only thing he said to me was, well, you're not hurting anybody, so why worry about it? Yeah. I see nothing wrong with loving balloons, and I'm going to continue to love them because that's what makes me happy. So take that, wife. (laughs) (laughs) That's not what he says. It is strange that uh, he doesn't mention that he loves his wife. uh, Not at all. Nor name her in any way or prove that she's real. But you can be sexually attracted to more than one thing, I suppose. Of um, course. I mean, he's got 50,000 to love. There's quite a lot of questions. One, putting your kiss in a balloon is one of, like, I don't know if it's just me. But, like, that's one of the worst things you could do. Like, that's weird material. And that's static. And, like, just... I wouldn't want to put it on my face, really, but I definitely wouldn't wouldn't want it on my lips. So that's weird. Also, if he's got 50,000 balloons in his house, surely they're continuously all going down, aren't they? This must be... This must be... He must have to curate this. Unless he has, like, deflated balloons. Mm, But I don't know what he would do with them. But... Balloons don't stay up for that long, so it must just be a constant. Every day, just blowing up another hundred balloons, maybe. I bet he's got lovely big lungs. Oh, lovely big lungs. But also, (laughs) you know, good on him. Fuck it, why not? Good on him. makes you happy, he's not harming anybody, apart from, you know, maybe his wife is upset. But maybe she's not, maybe she's perfectly happy. I'm sure she's having her own life doing something. She doesn't have to be there, she could leave. (laughs) I don't think there's room for her in this house with all these balloons. (laughs) Well, my last news story is what I would describe as funny headline, horribly depressing story. Oh, fantastic. (laughs) So I'm not going to dwell on it. Uh New England college student has legs amputated after eating leftover noodles. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. I remember reading this one and actually exactly the same feeling. Like, oh, this sounds amazing. Oh. (laughs) Yeah, so the long and short of it is I thought, oh, this is going to be be full of yucks. I'm really going to enjoy myself with this. Um, But no, um, it's really quite sad. (laughs) But uh, it did bring up a couple of questions. A 19-year-old man was admitted to an intensive care unit as a result of shock a multiple organ failure and rash. I feel like the rash is the least of it. <laughs> um, if only he had a limb to have a rash on. Yeah. <laughs> well, he doesn't anymore. Oh. Um, after eating some leftover ch- rice, chicken and lo mein. Whatever lo mein. mein is. What is lo mein? I, do, I have heard of that, but it's not a thing we have here. Uh, he began vomiting. His mate also ate it, who, was, who also vomited, but he didn't have to have any of his legs cut off or anything. <laughs> but this guy had chest pain, shortness of breath, so they rushed him to hospital and basically... He's had some of his fingers lopped off. Yeah. He's had both legs lopped off and it just gets sad. I didn't know his legs came off as well. I knew there were some fingers. Yeah. So uh, I think this is an old story, but it's been re-released recently because a doctor is basically telling people not to eat just eat leftover noodles. Well, um, but here's what I has blown my mind a little bit is throughout my life, my mother has always yeah. said, he's a bit of a warrior. She's <laughs> no. always said, don't eat leftover rice. Yeah. And I've always thought, you lunatic. Respectfully, <laughs> you're a mad woman, <laughs> and I will eat all the leftover rice that I want, and always have. Yeah. Uh, noodles, I wouldn't even consider. No. Chicken, I've never eaten, so I wouldn't know, but, I, but actually, I probably wouldn't eat old meat. It's probably honest. the meat but, that did it in this. Yeah, okay, maybe. But the point being, I just presumed it was the rice, because that's what my mum always said. Yeah. And I thought it was an old wives' tale. I know, I remember my, uh, my, one of my friend's mums getting horrendous food poisoning from some leftover yeah. rice. Is it, I think it's something about reheating it. Yeah, if you don't That's reheat it fully. Saying. Don't reheat your rice, you used to say. And I used to think, shut up, mum, I'm reheating my rice. Yeah. And now, good job I've still got all my limbs. You've got all your limbs, thank gosh. <laughs> when I, um, just to say, when I first read this story, um, the headline was written slightly different. And it was maybe a bit accusatory. Because it was, a guy eats housemates 
leftovers. Oh. So it was if like, <laughs> and then got his limbs off. Well, that's weird. more for you for eating someone else's leftover food. <laughs> um, but well, now we're and now we know it's both of them, so it doesn't sound so bad. But the other one was kind of accusing them. Oh, that's what you get if you steal someone's food out the fridge. It would be horrible if that was like the housemate who was just bitter about the fact that he didn't get his noodles. <laughs> But this and this guy comes back and he's got no legs and no fingers and he's just like right I'm right into the press you ate my fucking noodles yeah still doesn't mean that you should have done it <laughs> <laughs> low main what the fuck's low main I, what the fuck's low main I don't know I've heard of it but only in like American films right well, in if you know yeah shamcityroses at gmail dot com <laughs> um, should we go to Norfolk yay yeah. <laughs> I've got a couple of stories here. Actually, I'm going to stick with one, but I am going to make mention of a few beautiful stories I've had in Norfolk recently. Oh, very good. There was a dance competition that got cold off a bit. Well, it didn't get cold off. It went ahead much to the dismay of the competitors oh. because uh, there was piss everywhere. <laughs> the, toilet, the toilets overflowed and the professional dance competition was not happy. But Riley's of Norwich on Magdalen Street... Refused to comment on that. So was it a professional it dance a professional competition in a Riley's? In a Riley's in Norfolk, <laughs> uh, there was a description of one girl had to put her hands in the urinal and scoop out stuff. What was in it? I don't fucking know. <sighs> but the picture. Oh, can went, you imagine if any I, of those darts players shat in the urinal? Uh, <laughs> how how much blockage there would be? They said that the carpets were squelchy. Uh, full of urine, four metres away from the toilets, they said. So that's what I wasn't going to go into that too much. Uh, there was another one about an umbrella. What, into the urinal? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it weren't me. I ain't putting my fists in the urinal. <laughs> um, there was another one about a man that lost his umbrella and a year later it turned up on the roof of an abandoned building. <laughs> that was a headline in Norwich. But I'm going with this one because it's very close to my home. Oh. So I'm, I've, I, and I think it's brilliant and it's very current. And I hope there's someone from Norfolk giving this a listen, because they can fucking go and see what's going on in this no. thing. Uh, City Ghost Hunters launch Paranormal Investigations Unit. <laughs> you heard right. You wondered, and now it's happening. A new group dedicated to ghostly sightings and things that go bump in the night has been set up in the city. I would say it's not in the city. It is in Thorpe St Andrew, where I used to go to school. And uh, I reckon that if you're nearby, Tanya, you live down the road from this place, if you're listening, and, you, and I know you're going to want to do this. What wonderful podcasting. Hi, Tanya. <laughs> <laughs> she won't think she's on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Thorpes and Andrew Paranormal Investigators Group has, seen, or has already seen more than 20 ghost hunters sign up in less than 24 hours. Uh, Is Lee- this just a Facebook group? Sorry. Hold off one second. I, I didn't say it was a Facebook group. No, I I'm asking you. Is it? But no. who, how have they signed up? I don't know, but they're meeting up, and I'll tell you a bit more about that. This, I was expecting some sort of Ghostbusters group, except obviously nerds. Who well, like you say nerds? Us a little bit nerds, a little bit middle-aged women, a bit bored at home. Oh, I reckon. God. Lisa Wood, fifty-four. <laughs> now I'm I'm looking at you, and I'm I'm sure you must be like someone I know's mum. I'm trying to think who I know who you are. <laughs> But she, uh, she's the joint admin for the group. She's been interested in spiritual activity ever since her childhood. She says, I've never physically seen a ghost, but I do believe in spirits. And uh, I think there's been lots of signs in my own life. I believe spirits are in birds. And on the recent <laughs> anniversary of my mum, uh, of my mum's passing, I saw a robin that landed right near my foot and was hopping around. <laughs> Uh, I believe in angels, which I know makes me sound like a mad person. And recently, Why are angels madder than spirits? I don't know what the difference is. Well, exactly. What's the fucking difference? Well, that's why we're not in this group. And they, she's that's the true. admin. She, I mean, she there's fucking, a lot of reasons why we're not in this group. She fucking knows. <laughs> Go on. Uh, the only reason we're not in this group is because we don't live in Thorpe St. Andrew. Believe me. Yes. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I recently thought there was a bad spirit in my home, so I burnt some sage, and the atmosphere feels much better now. <laughs> um, as a teenager. When she said burnt some sage, does she mean she made some sage and onion stuff them? Oh, what, burn her? <laughs> then they just ate it. Uh, no. <laughs> She no, she don't look like she eat much stuff. Yeah. Um, as a teenager, I started reading really quite dark stuff, mm. and I've become and it's become a long, long, 
interest from men. Oh, I bet when she says dark stuff, she means like... Flowers in the attic. Oh, yeah, exactly, like a Stephen King book. Exactly. Oh, I got into the really dark stuff. (laughs) Uh, Toby Bunton, who's 27, he's joined. I've only ever done my own paranormal investigations, (laughs) and I wanted to see how it works with others and find new and interesting places to visit. Being in Forbes and Andrew myself, that's local and it's very easy to meet up. <laughs> um, someone from Great Plumstead, she's into it as well. She said, I, I've been up as far as Liverpool on ghost hunts. And I thought, well, you know, fuck it, I'm going there. That's not what it said. <laughs> I'm par- as you can imagine, I'm paraphrasing quite wildly. Um, I've experienced so much from being touched on the face at Anzio Army Camp Barracks. What the fuck does that mean? To communicate with spirit on the Ouija boards in K2 metres. So, so, pardon? She was touched on the face in an army barracks. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I mean, that sounds a bit worrying. I know. Uh, but, you know, it was a ghost, inverted commas, fuck me. <laughs> uh, the group's first meeting is going to be taking place at the cottage on Thunder Lane in Thorpe's Nandu. These people haven't even met yet, and there's already a they newspaper. Met. Okay, right. Okay. They've just met. When right. this was released, it wasn't. No, so who's writing this fucking article? Uh, why? Why is this a story? No, because they were it's a a drumming group? up, drumming up. You know, <laughs> okay. you can go. It was February the twenty eighth, so literally yesterday they all met at the pub, the pub that I used to go to after school, <laughs> get me lasagna and chips when I was too young to drink, and when I could drink, go there for our Christmas they, Eve drinkies. Did they used to leave uh, cheese and onion crisps onto the door so that you would leave? <laughs> Oi! You fucking compare me to livestock. That's not fair. That's not fair. But yeah, they met up at six thirty yesterday. So if anyone's listening, went there, fucking tell us how it went. And I'd if you didn't go there, how do we meet? There's a link to the first meeting. I wonder if it was a Facebook event. Yes, it was. So I will be clicking on that when uh, when this podcast is over and signing up. And next time we're in Norwich, David. I you best wanna... believe we're going to the. To be I fair, we should I go to the cottage go. pub anyway because it's very lovely in there. Very I... nice. I mean, um, uh, isn't Norfolk the like centre of all ghost activities in the UK? Supposedly? It is an abnormally high amount of UFO sightings seen there. Oh, is it but UFOs? I, I would say, and no disrespect to Norfolk, there's many, many reasons for why this has been thought. Um, and I would compare it similarly to where the highest sightings happen in America, <laughs> yes, which so is in these flat <laughs> desert areas where there's not a lot of people live there. And there's not so there's a, two things you could not say a there. Not great deal of education. Oi, 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 there. Don't even... <laughs> I'm getting to that. <laughs> it could be the flat terrain, the lack of people. It could be all those things. It might be <laughs> something to do with the type of people that live there. Maybe they're a bit odd and ain't seen that many humans. Who, who? I couldn't say. You couldn't say. I would, I would err on the side of it being flat. <laughs> many would disagree and maybe lean towards the uh, thought process of some of these people. I think that once one person sees, it's it's human nature, isn't it? Once one person says they see a ghost in any place, yeah. that just then five people who are their mates then all say, "Oh, yeah, I've seen a ghost too." Yeah, and then. 20 people that are all of their mates. Oh, I've seen a ghost too. Oh, what, we 20 should set people up a, in the cottage? We should set up a group. Fuck Let's it. get on the Facebook. Oh, I love it. That's multi-age, multi-gendered group. I think it's brilliant. <laughs> Us looks very good. I can't wait to find out more about this. If you live in Norwich, or specifically Thorpe St Andrew, because it's probably just a short walk from your ass, I think you should fucking go to this group. Uh, I sure will be working out a time to visit Norwich at the same time as a group, I reckon. I'd, I'd like to see. Around. I'd like to be a. I'd like to be a um, fly on the wall. I don't think I'd like to be a. I imagine it's quite socially awkward. I would quite like to go to this pub anyway, David. So next time we're there, we can even if we're not officially clicking attending on the Facebook group, uh, we should just go and do our own investigation of this investigation. Oh, we can investigate ghost investigators. We could say we're doing a documentary for our podcast. Yeah, <gasps> investigators. What's it of... called? Para para no. no uh, what's that? Panorama. <laughs> <laughs> we can be... <laughs> Panorama. <laughs> Fuck up. Paranormal. Can... <laughs> Paranormal. Panorama. Pa- what? I fucking said it. You didn't. <laughs> Panorama. We could do a pa- like a Breakfast Pugs podcast. Panorama. 
podcast Panora- episode. Pa- first of all, I don't think Panorama exists anymore, does it? Well, Isn't I don't it know. like an eighties program? But also, no, or nineties. It's that thing that like broke out. You know, the horrible um, being rude and nasty to disabled <laughs> children. <laughs> okay. It found that out, didn't it? It did. It and did. That was it's only like, an, like it the last an, ten No, years. you're right. You've got the right idea. But I feel like the sort of people that make Panorama documentaries are like really quite highfalutin oh, filmmakers and what are you not trying just to say me about and us? you with our smartphones no but like, they all had to start somewhere and if <laughs> if you're saying that don't even exist no more then uh well there's there's a gap in the market i reckon <laughs> and i re- shit documentary <laughs> made by us I could be proper, um, I don't know how your phone flip. I don't know how you can flip from your camera facing one way to your camera facing the face. Well, that's, face. you might want to start with that if we're, if but we're once making I, a, But once I've learned that, once I've learned that, and I reckon I could learn that by, you know, the next meeting yeah, in a month's probably, time. Yeah, you could learn that, yeah. And then we could be we could have our phones kind of positioned under the table and we could be, like, casually drinking our beer. Do you mean, like... Should we get GoPros? Do you mean, like, these people that have, like, hidden cameras? Yeah, Is but, that what you're talking Well, about? no, but that's... We could get GoPros. We could get GoPros and um, stick them on our foreheads. <laughs> uh, you seen Dave, any ghosts, have you? David, stop speaking too loud. They're going to hear us. <laughs> That boy's not even from Norwich. Oh, that was well. my that was a really bad Norwich impression, which is why I'd be caught out immediately. They know banished. you. He's foreign. Where's he come he's from? Foreign. <laughs> he's not from round here. <laughs> oh, you posh boy with your voice. What are you doing up there? <laughs> anyway, anyone who would like to come with me to Norwich will be staying in uh, Mr. Orlando's B and B. No, what's he called? Mr. Williams. That's it. Uh, we'll be eating Japanese food at Orlando's. He's a and b He's definitely not a restaurant. We'll be staying there and we'll be visiting the uh, Paranormal Investigations Group in Thorpe and Andrew. And for new listeners, as ever, Siobhan has completely ignored the fact that you may not <laughs> have a clue what she's talking about. Well, Go back and listen to every episode of our <laughs> and you might get some vague idea. It'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> Should we play some music? Yeah! Uh, this song is by Midwich Cuckoos. Cuckoos? Cuckoos? Cuckoos. Cuckoos. This song is by Midwich Cuckoos, um, who are from London. Uh, it's from their new album, Death or Glory, which is available to pre-order now. You can go on their band camp and listen to, I think, about six or seven songs off it. But you can also pre-order it, and they've made their own beer. Way. You can pre-order the beer as well. And a comic yeah. book, I think. Sounds oh, cool. Yeah. Anyway, the song's called Sucker. The album's called Death or Glory. This is Midwich Cuckoos. <laughs>
I did! <coughs> and he dashes. Hey Stooge, fancy seeing you here. You must have smelled our delicious breakfast. Or could it be the Raj here who just had too much cold beer and blew us a cool stiff breeze right out of his bottle? You must be gutted you've run out of Breakfast Punk's episodes to listen to. I can't live without my music. But would you be interested in an extra helping? Yeah! Are you hungry for a bit more? Yeah! How about an extra bowl of Breakfast Punk's podcast? Yeah! Eat a bowl of fuck! Sign up for our Patreon now for an exclusive monthly episode, the opportunity to vote on the films to be reviewed, sneaky extras and a whole lot of love. Your support will help us make improvements to the show, upgrade our equipment and maybe get our cats some new shoes. My parents are going to be real sorry if I don't get them cha-cha here. I ask and I better get Sign up now at patreon.com forward slash breakfast punks podcast. We really appreciate your support. I'll tell you what, babe. I'll hold yours if you hold mine. Welcome back to the Breakfast Punks podcast. We're now going to talk about a very strange subject matter. <laughs> uh, and this might be a little bit different to our normal main sections, I think, because I would like to just tell your story. It's story. <laughs> story time with Dave. Bay bay. Bay bay. Boom. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about this guy, Rinse Stream. He's, that's not his real name, surprisingly enough. It's he's, easier to say than his real name. It's really easier. So I'm going to call him Rinse Dream continuously and probably call this episode Rinse Dream, so yeah. it'll make it easier. But his real name is Stephen Sayadian. Yeah. And he is a guy who made a film, which is, I thought, relatively well known, uh, called Dr. Caligari. It's a remake of a 1920s horror movie. Which was also, I think, remade again in like the 60s or something, but the 60s version is dreadful. The original 1920s version is a German silent film, which doesn't really have very much to do with his remake Mm. in a lot of ways. Uh, But we'll talk about that a little bit when we actually get to the film. But the story that I would like to tell you is about a young man called David, <laughs> that's <laughs> me, no uh, who, um, who had heard about this film for a long time, had never watched it. And about a couple of months ago, I found it on the internet and I thought, oh, that film looks pretty cool. And I thought it was like a, cl- like a classic film, like what, the sort of thing that we've been covering on this podcast. Like an like 80s real, trash horror. An 80s trash horror, exactly that. When, it, when was Dr. Caligari made? 1989. Okay, cool. So it fitted into all of that. I've read about it in various books about like trashy 80s horror movies. It's obviously, you know, it's quite a low budget film. It has, and I definitely could, you could argue it fits into a horror in the, in the grandest scheme of things. Yeah. It's sort of, it sort of got a horror feel to it. I don't know what genre you would put it in, really. But I thought, oh, I'll sit down, watch this film, popped it on, and it is the craziest fucking movie I've ever seen, I think. <laughs> I, can't, I honestly can't think of anything that even comes close to it. So I finished watching the film, which, again, we'll talk about in more detail a little bit later, and I thought, this is perfect for the podcast. I've got to find out more about this guy. Mm. This, um, and he's not listed as Rinse Dream on, uh, on that film. He's uh, Stephen Sayadian. And um, he works closely with a writer whose name is Jerry Stahl. And so I thought, I'm going to look into these guys, and this is going to make a brilliant podcast episode. Find out all the information about them. How the fuck did this film ever get made? Who the fuck are all these people in this film? And there's a couple of people in the film that um, I recognise from other things, two of whom were in Repo Man, which is like one of my favourite movies, and I'm sure a film that most people have seen. And I was just like, how does this thing exist? (laughs) And who is behind this thing? So I looked into his life and I found that there's almost nothing on the internet about him. Um, And it was really difficult to kind of track him down. But the one thing that it did say that he'd made a couple of films before this, one of which was called Cafe Flesh, which was quite famous. And uh, one of which was called Night Dreams. But there's Night Dreams is like one, two and three. So I checked out Cafe Flesh and Night Dreams. They're hardcore pornography. (laughs) So I thought to myself, well, this is even more interesting. So I read up a little bit about Cafe Flesh. Turns out... The fucking craziest porno film. <laughs> and again, we'll talk about it in more detail. Also, you... porno inverted commas. Well, it, hard to say whether... Well, that's the interesting thing yeah. about Cafe Flesh, really. It's a film that was made under the guise of pornography and was obviously paid for 
it has a budget of some sort and it was yeah. obviously paid for by someone saying to this guy, make me a porno film. And he makes <laughs> something which I, I get, we'll talk about it more. We'll, we'll get yeah. to the, the exact It kind of but... ticks the box of porn, literally like, I will tick the box of porn, but then here's the rest of my stuff. But actually, this is the most yeah. anti-pornography film ever made. And yeah. it's really, I think it's really interesting. Now, I actually have to say, I think that Cafe Flesh is brilliant, to be honest. I mean, I love them both. So I think, oh my God, this is brilliant. We have to do a podcast about this. So I go into, I look into absolutely everything that I can possibly find. Yeah. And the only thing that I can find, this guy, Stephen Syadian, seems to go missing more or less after Dr. Caligari. But the guy that wrote all of these films, including the porno films, this Jerry Stahl guy, turns out wrote an episode of Twin Peaks, <laughs> was a staff writer on ALF, the 1980s um, like children's programme about a that furry a, alien. Yeah, yeah that like, like armadillo-looking a, thing a or whatever wise, he is. A wisecracking alien. <laughs> um, he was a staff writer on the Bruce Willis and is it Kirsty Alley like sitcom that they both got famous in. I think it's yeah. called Moonlighting, but I might be Yeah, wrong. it might be called that. I know, I can see what it looks like. Terrible. Um, so, and he wrote Bad Boys 2. <laughs> So this guy's got like a proper career in Hollywood. So I thought, all right, brilliant. I'll find out some stuff about him. Turns out he's written a memoir. So buy the memoir, read the memoir, thinking there's going to be loads of stuff about Dr. Caligari and Cafe Flesh in this. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing about it. But no. turns out he's, his memoir is all about basically him being a, properly addicted to heroin. Oh. And leading this really like dodgy life whilst always going in and like meeting up with Bruce Willis and writing scripts for him and then going to like the worst places in LA and doing Get heroin, heroin. Oh, and almost gosh. dying like 20 times. And I have to say, so the <laughs> is he memoir. Still alive? Yes, he is Good alive. He, he doesn't look very alive but, oh. and he can't be that old. But yeah, this uh, book by Jerry Starr, it's called Permanent Midnight. I would really recommend it because I tend to not enjoy books that are just like, oh, I was on heroin for 20 years. Mm. So I did this and then I tried to get off heroin and then it turns out I couldn't. So I'm back on it again. There's loads of books like that, particularly by, written by musicians and stuff like the Motley Crue book being one. And I think Nicky Six wrote his own one. Yeah. And uh, that fucking boy from Red Hot Chili Peppers. Oh, yeah, yeah, His yeah. one's quite and famous. Nikita's. And like... They, they're just like they're fine and on the one hand it's kind of like oh it's quite interesting because it's a little uh, window into like the darker side of life or whatever. Yeah. but it's so boring being around a heroin addict is so fucking boring because <laughs> you're just doing the same thing over and over again <laughs> but I have to say Jerry Stoll is, is a very funny man but like dry wit not like laugh out loud funny thus and, he wrote bad boys too well apparently so <laughs> but um his book permanent midnight is a, is the best version of the i i was on heroin and now i'm not story that i've ever read and one of the really interesting things about it is that he wrote it literally when he was like a month clean oh okay and then he actually did end up relapsing later on but he was right he had a daughter um and it's not too it makes it sound a bit schmaltzy but he basically had a daughter Although when she was born, he was busy doing heroin and a squat. But um, <laughs> but he had a daughter and he was like, I've got to change my life for my daughter. And so at this point, he's like been thrown out of his house. His life has just fallen apart. He's lost everything. But someone gives him a book deal to write this book. And so it's an interesting book because it's both his story, but it also like every between every chapter, it's like where he's at at that right. very moment in time, which must have been in 1980. 1990 or something mm. i don't know exactly when it was written and yeah he's just kind of like a fairly charming well charming probably is pushing it. he does a lot of really horrible dodgy things but he's he's a he's a very good writer anyway oh, okay but I'm point sure. being i read the fucking book doesn't he, the only thing it says <laughs> it didn't help you for this podcast not at all the only <laughs> thing it says is at one point when he really hits rock bottom he goes and sees his friend rinse dream <laughs> and Rinse Dream lets him stay highlight that bit in the book yeah, yeah, exactly. oh. <laughs> and all that happens is he lets him stay in his house for a little while while he gets off heroin but he doesn't really get off heroin he just sneaks out and does loads of heroin while he's Aww. there um, and then I think maybe even steals some money from him and then fucks off so that didn't really help me very much as it turns out I've managed to find more or less the only information about this guy as far as I can work out anyway. yeah and what actually happened was that in 1995 he became really unwell and so he did literally just for 10 years he was just really sick um Aww. and at the time that the article was written which was in 2013 him and jerry Starr had apparently just written a new film and he was going to write he was going to make this film i can't there's no evidence of it so i presume it just never happened oh, that's a shame. so he's 
entire career is more or less three, no, four porno films. Uh, there's another one as well called something like Dr. Bongo a Go Go or something. Oh, God. But we didn't really delve too much into it. Some of the pornography looks like it's just pornography. But he obviously at some point became this director and just subverted absolutely everything there is to subvert about both pornography and about filmmaking in general. Yeah. So he started at Hustler magazine. Uh, he was apparently, he was like a budding um, sort of comedian or comedic writer. And mm-hmm. he was trying to get his work in things like Mad Magazine and that okay. sort of stuff. But he ended up getting a job at Hustler. And I think they were connected in some way to this National Lampoon, which was an old magazine. Okay. You might know, like, National Lampoon made a load of films, like Animal House and stuff. Oh, okay, it, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought, it, is it the same National Lampoon? Well, kind I'm of. I mean, I think it was like a, of. yeah, it's like a brand. Yeah. And I don't know exactly... I think there is a couple of people that are behind it. Okay. And I presume they started on this magazine and then they ended up making all these films. But I don't know how much... I know those films went on for a long time. And yeah. It was like, there was one called Men in White, which was a mock of Men in Black. And it had Biff from... A really old version <coughs> of Biff from uh, Back to the Future. Yeah. And it was literally, like, made on a digital camera. Oh. Like, worse CGI. Terrible. I feel like National Lampoons might have ended up just becoming a thing that someone thing bought that, or yeah. something. You know, like it was just a name that they stuck on comedy films to try and get people to watch them. Oh, right, thing. okay. Anyway, he started at Hustler and he was sort of a staff writer. And then at some point, Hustler decided that they were going to start their own sex toy business. Mm. And I think Larry Flint was basically just trying to piss people off because he was being called pornography. He didn't, you know, there's a, there's, that's a whole other story that we can't get into. Yeah. That is covered in the film People vs. Larry Flynn. Yes, that's what I've I heard I think of. in lots of documentaries and things. Uh, it's quite an interesting story. But um, he was trying to piss people off and he decided he was going to start this sex toy business. And he asked Rince Dream to make adverts and he more or less just said, do whatever you want. Yeah. I don't care if I don't sell a single dildo. Just make an advert that will that will weird people out, and we can put it in Hustler magazine. Yeah, and he did exactly that. And um, I would I um, I will try and share a link to this thing because, like I say, there's not very much about him. But if you just um, if you Google Rinse Dream, this definitely will come up. And there is an advert from Hustler which I'll try and describe. It is a half naked woman holding a plate of food. Behind her is a woman who's just stood in the background amongst some like dead trees holding a an umbrella with holes in it and she sort of has these weird conical things over her boobs and then in the background to that there's four 50s styled milkmen in bow ties and hats who have been whited up and are beneath like four sort of office lights And then uh, covering all of this is some barbed wire around the floor. And then there is what appears to be an adult baby (laughs) just just sat amongst the, like behind a fence. And they're all looking away from the camera. And there is no evidence that this is in any way an advert for anything. Fantastic. And this would have just been in Hustler magazine and you would have just turned a page and there was just this crazy picture. And the important thing to say about this guy probably is that he's more like an art director than anything else i think right and so everything he's done has this really specific look and the films have this really specific look i'd say cafe flesh slightly less so but dr caligari is basically just he's the vision of like inside his brain yeah yeah it's like a color explosion it's really jagged yeah it's it really like cool. 80s. It's really weird. Uh, like, yeah, I think that... I mean, I don't know if you would say that Tim Burton was influenced by him what? or maybe he... But there is a, <laughs> there's a Tim Burton-esque, but it's, like, turned up to 11. It's so much weirder than anything It's Tim really Burton. strange. It has this, like, feeling of... And I... I'm definitely wrong in saying this because what I'm about to say is a children's thing, but that trapdoor programme that was really colourful but dark with bits of colour, yeah. really jaggedy and really, like... Not a lot going on other than these very colourful things, no. like there, which there is extraordinarily a lot of. So I don't mean to say there's not a lot, but there's something about that weird. I can't really describe it better than a weird ch- <laughs> like this child's thing when it's definitely nothing to do with a children's program. No, but in a lot of ways, but it does have. Yeah, I think you're totally right there. I think it's and one of the reasons why it's so incredible is it is because it's taken something like say let's use Trapdoor as an example. Yeah, something which is made in animation. Yeah. But it's managed to do that with actual real human beings yeah. walking around. And, uh, and I think that in modern times, that wouldn't be that surprising. There's loads of like CGI, you know, like Sin City, yeah. you know, where they really over-CGI things. And yeah. there's loads of films like that that have been made since computers have come into uh, the fore. 
And I think that's quite easy to do now. But yeah. in 1989, obviously, there was none of that. And this was all done completely practically. Yeah. And so every, every single still of, particularly Dr. Caligari, but in a lot of ways, all of his films, look like a surrealist painting. Yes. But within the context of, like some, like I say, some of these are just fucking porno films. Yeah. You know? Like, it's so weird that those two things ever came together. So, really, the reason why I want to do this podcast... So, we've, we've, been, a, we've been a bit sneaky, I suppose, with this episode. <laughs> we've purposefully... We're going to be reviewing a film about punk music later on. Yeah. Partly because I'm not really sure how much we're going to be able to have to say about this guy yeah, yeah, yeah. because i can't find that much information um but also because we didn't really want this to just be a trashy yeah. movie uh review podcast from from the start but so, this bit ends up being like the trashy movie bit of our podcast I, almost yeah, pretty much although mostly we're just gonna be talking about pornos yeah so uh <laughs> so let's get into it so me and Javon watched up to caligari and we watched cafe flesh i will say that both cafe cafe flesh and night dreams are available on Vimeo without the pornographic scenes in them. Yeah. Uh, so you can easily get all of this stuff online. Uh, Dr. Caligari's on YouTube, uh, which I'll obviously share on this. I would just, I suppose I really want to do this podcast just to say to people, watch Dr. Caligari. It's yeah. fucking mental. Uh, I don't think it's going to be for everyone uh, by any means. And in fact, I <laughs> think it's, I'm not even sure it's going to be for many people, but I would say even if you can just watch it for 10 minutes and be like, like I say, the thing about this is, yeah. how the fuck does this thing well, exist? That's I would, really what I want to get across. Definitely. And I would say, actually, if anyone's debating watching it, do watch the first 10 minutes, be freaked out, and then carry on, because I think mm. it becomes extraordinarily watchable, even if the first 10 minutes are, what the fuck, am I going to be able to watch this? Yeah. You soon get into the, the flow, if you can call it flow, of, <laughs> of the most jaggedy, nonsensical... I mean, nothing about this film technically flows, yet, no. weirdly, there is a story. It's just the dialogue. The dialogue and the visual does not flow at all, as in it's stilted and is deliberately hard to watch. Um, yeah, the, but yet, there's a story. Well, the dialogue, kind of the dialogue is kind of, I would describe it as sort of sixth form poetry. Yeah. You know, but not, but in a way, that's, that, that's not a nice thing to say about dialogue, but... It works really well as a result of that, I think. Well, and there's bits where some of the characters, because these people probably can act, it's just never clear in this film. Yeah. Apart from, there's two people that I think actually do a very good job of showing that they're acting and are very good at it. But the rest of them seem like people who have never learnt words before. Yeah. But it didn't matter because one person will be speaking like this and then I'm saying these things. And then they'll take on a completely different voice and say some other words. And then they'll change their voice again and say some other words, speaking it at various places in the room to seemingly no one. You well, just think, what the fuck is going so, on? <laughs> I suppose, I think, let's, I mean, let's get into it. Let's talk about yeah. Dr. Caligari to start with. That is definitely one of the main things that blew my mind about it. Was, yeah. And one of the reasons why it comes across in, like I say, such a way of like, how does this exist? Is because there's not loads of people in this movie. There's probably 15 or something. Yeah. And... I don't know how you can get that many people to act in this bizarre way yeah. that does flow within itself, yeah. but is unlike anything else that's ever been done before. How do you, just, as a director or writer or whatever, how do you describe that to these random people? Because yeah. you're doing this on a budget. The budget for this film is was 175 grand. And basically what he says is that someone would really like Café Flesh someone who had made loads of porno films. Right. But they, but they wanted to make a slasher film. And he said he used to get, after people saw Café Flesh, because it was, whilst it was a porn film, it was like a midnight movie as well. So yeah. It was, it was mentioned in the same breath as things like A Razor Head and things like Pink Flamingos. Pink Flamingos. And so he kept getting offered like trashy horror movies, like slasher movies and stuff. And this guy came to him and said, I want you to make a slasher film, but I want it to be based on Dr. Caligari this 1920s film because it's out of copyright and it's my favourite film. Okay. And he said, well, I'll make it, but here's my provisos. And yeah. my provisos are that I ignore the story entirely <laughs> and do whatever I want to do. And the guy gave him 175 grand and he made it. <laughs> but so in that context, like 175 grand is obviously quite a lot of money but it, um, and probably was quite a lot of money in 1989, but it's still a tiny budget for a film. Yeah. So these people weren't, yeah, they might have been actors, but they weren't, they weren't big actors. There's quite a lot of people that I guess came from the porn world, 
because there's a few people that were in Cafe Flesh, although none of the people that actually do the porn. Yeah. That's another interesting thing. In in um, in his porno films, there's a bunch of people that are acting and are actually actors who've gone on to have careers in acting. But are they doing the porn? But they're not doing the porn, but it's still, I suppose, what sort? how do you end up in that position? How do you end up being the actor <laughs> who gets... Well, no, not literally. Yeah. Not in position. Like, like to my, I, and I suppose maybe this is the difference in what pornography has become. Like, porno companies aren't hiring actors to come and do acting in their porn if they're not going to fuck anybody, are they, anymore? Yeah. I mean, I don't think in 2022, pornography isn't really made with a storyline. I'm no expert in this. I'm not coy about porn, but it's not definitely not my... Uh, expertise yeah in any way and nor do I particularly have any interest in it so I can't say this for sure but I don't think that for the most part most pornography isn't made as a film anymore for one thing because it's made yeah. the internet isn't it so it's like here's a scene not yeah. here's an hour and a half's worth of movie so I guess in that context there's no there's nothing to compare it to in the modern world yeah I hear what you're saying um, but for a porno film to have as much storyline as some of his have or at least Cafe Flesh has. I don't know. I don't know. How do you how do you talk? How do you as an actor come in and you're like, right, there's going to be people coming all over each other, but also I just want you to pretend to be a post-nuclear freak. <laughs> Here's your bottom double. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but the people, what I'm talking about, yeah, there's a few people that they, who end up having bottom doubles, yeah. but there's loads of people in these films. What I'm saying, I suppose, is there's loads of actors in these porno films that aren't porno. They're not doing any porno. They're nothing to do with it. They're, they're, just, there they're just there because there's such a strong storyline within that they have it to have some that they have to have a load of actors. Yes, it's, like, it's like a film that happens to have some hardcore scenes. In yeah. It. Whereas... I don't, you know, that doesn't exist anymore, does yeah, it? Yeah, it's true. You know? And I think it's, it, and there's a very definite, like, line between the two. Like you say, you can get, uh, on Vimeo, you can get versions of, and I know we're talking about uh, Dr. Caligari at the minute, but the other two films, you can get the versions with all the porn removed, mm. which I imagine is still, say, for example, the film's an hour and 20 minutes long. It's probably still an hour of film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe yeah, more, definitely. because there's just so much work that is in it and so much like you say storytelling so yeah there's plenty of space for these actors to be there but yeah like you say by the way guys there's also these bits where you're just going to watch someone ejaculate on someone else yeah and by the way that girl's also you yeah but it isn't you because we've got a double for that bit <laughs> yeah. so fucking weird but yeah so dr caligari is not pornography uh, yeah. it is quite sort of i suppose you might describe it as erotic I mean, it's not a. Ro- it's not definitely. I mean, I mean not nothing. Nothing this man has made will get yeah. you hard. Like there's, it's not an. <laughs> he's not an erotic filmmaker. There's, even there's the boobs but. and uh, sex, yeah. but not actual sex that you see. But it's also, not porn, but the film is and all it's a, not erotic. The film is all about sex, yes. as well. In, so uh, the idea of it is, is that Dr. Caligari is this crazy German woman yeah. who is doing sort of sexy psychological Therapy. therapies on people in a lunatic asylum i think yeah. it is described as a lunatic asylum i don't think i'm being non-pc well it's it's called the cia but it stands for something insane asylum i can't yeah. remember what the c stands for and it's, it's yeah quite funny. the tagline is better living through chemistry <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which i really like um but yeah i mean i don't there's not really any point in us trying to describe the the plot but fundamentally it's that a guy who's worried about his uh, wife's libido, puts her in a mental asylum, which has a lot of metaphor. I feel like that's a very metaphorical aspect of the film. Yeah. She goes in, there's lots of people being generally mad, and then uh, Dr Caligari starts swapping people's libidos around. Yeah. And then people start swapping genders, and someone who was very coy when they first come in become particularly like sexualized and it's all just mad as fuck and weird and yeah. I, mean, I think beyond that there's not much point in us going into the to the actual plot <sighs> i mean i don't know if the plot goes much like no, it's it quite really, yeah. <laughs> as much as there is a story it's quite um not hard to follow uh, yeah. but i don't think it really does anything else other than that but i think metaphorically there's loads of really interesting things in there really i mean it's very uh, it's a, uh they they mention cole young at one point and wilhelm oh, yeah. reich and stuff and i mean i feel like although it's difficult to i I don't want to over intellectualize this either yeah but there's a lot of things that you can read into it really like there's various lines that made me think of think of different things and i don't know whether i've misread it or not there's one guy who's getting ect in the electric chair and he puts a load of pins in his bottom so that it will so we'll get more electricity in him because he really likes the oh, he likes game. it yeah and i thought that reminded me of the serial killer albert fish 
that used to put uh, <laughs> he used to put pins in his ball bag. Oh. Um, there's a lot of like weird big sores that come out on people's faces and stuff. Oh yeah, at boils various and different stuff. boils and stuff, and it starts with. Um, it starts with those boils. And I wonder, just because it was made in 1989, that it feels a little bit like it might be AIDS-related in some way. And obviously because this film is oh. all about sex and perversion and all that sort of stuff. Like, I don't know whether there's some whether they're making a statement about that. It's very Ooh. difficult to say. There's one point where somebody says staff is expendable, but genius is not. And that felt rather like something that Ayn Rand might say. <laughs> I thought. Um, and uh, my favourite, probably... <laughs> Probably my favourite line in is it is it when somebody says explain your life in three words or less and they say unending torment. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's how the film ends as well. Yeah, they repeat they, that they line. Repeat that a couple of times. Yeah, it's fucking brilliant. Um, excitement is the essence of life, and when it's over, you're dead. <laughs> that's that's a good line. That's as well. a brilliant line. But there's loads of shit like that, and I, and I, and I suppose it, again, it's all sit form poetry. Like it's not. I don't think anyone's going to win an award for the script on this thing. Yeah. Although you said that someone had written some sort of academic paper about it. Didn't you? Not about this one, about the porn film. Oh, right. Yeah, okay. we'll I'll get to that. I mean, I'll get to right. that. <laughs> With reference to the boils, uh, when the woman who's gone in there for her own treatment, her husband gets put in there for a bit as well, and he ends up with these boils coming out on her his face and she's talking in loads of different voices and then all of a sudden she just turns to the camera after looking at his face and says i see that face and i'm a love slut <laughs> <laughs> i was just like what is going yeah, on there's a lot of stuff like that where, <laughs> yeah where people's voices like they yeah they, they're, they're acting voices. in a certain way and then suddenly they'll put on a different voice yeah. and they'll like turn a different way to the yeah. camera and there's loads of stuff that's almost like dance choreographed yeah. as well that we didn't really mention that well I, I've written like that. a bit of that down because there's these two agents that keep turning up they're almost investigating what's going on and they're doing this kind of almost new order you know that video um, yeah, where they where slap they're slapping each other in the other. face yeah, yeah. and I've likened it to diva and craft work in the way that they stand because mm. there's loads of bits where they stand talking to Dr Caligari and all three of them are looking in a different direction kind of like 45 degrees angle onto the camera which is very like that craft work album yeah. and then there's lots of of like Devo movements and choreography where they all take it in turns to kind of look different ways and doing different things. I feel um, like there's a bit it's of very Devo. beautiful. There's a bit of way. Devo in there actually. I mean there's 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 um a baby face, isn't there? For yeah. A while, which feel, is really similar to the Devo face. It's but, very like Mr. Boogie uh what's they call him? They call uh, him Bougie Boy. Bougie Boy. Yeah. But yeah, actually I I never really put two and two together. And some of the soundtrack the soundtrack's great for all of these films actually. Yeah. But some of the soundtrack it's not really Devo esque, but it's kind of that weird synth uh, it's yeah. really jolting. A lot of it's really jolting, but it's it's odd because it's a mixture, and I think this is true of Cafe Flesh as well. It's a mixture of this like jolty, weird eighties synth mm. and like jazz, like freeform yeah. jazz and stuff. Which I think, when it comes to Cafe Flesh, I feel like is almost taking the piss out of the music that would normally be in the background of porn films, which is this kind of like or like weird like yeah, jazzy of. background. Except they've got this like jolty fucking circus music going on in the yeah. background. I mean, I wrote down a bit about the sound here because I said it sounded like it was almost underwater and at some points there was no real dialogue like people were talking but it wasn't directly coming out of their mouth like yeah. the music and the and the dialogue got really mashed and there was no proper dialogue in Dr Caligari for about 10 15 minutes mm. um because it's all just weird noise and, and if just, it was it sounded like again it sounded like it was underwater it was mm. really mishmashed with the music but I think that works really well in this just because it looks so beautiful yeah I think you've got you know you you have to you can't go into this wanting there is a bit of narrative but there's not really there's no <laughs> the narrative isn't important the important thing is just like getting sucked into the world that it is yeah like. and getting really involved in all the colour like you better yeah. like colour because it's neon as fuck and it's well good but so I think then we probably move on to Cafe Flesh really because in a lot of ways that's even more interesting because like yeah. I say it's one thing for a movie to be made in that way yeah but then for a hardcore pornography film to be made in that way it just blew my mind yeah so the the i just think cafe flesh is such a genius idea so the idea is that it's set in the near future and in the near future there are sex negatives and sex positives and 99 percent of the population are sex negatives which means that they're unable to have sex and if they try it makes them sick and but the one percent who are sex positive who basically can have sex are forced to have sex 
in front of all the sex negatives and they go to this place called Cafe Flesh where they have to watch them. And of course the the thing is is because these people themselves can't have sex it's just so dark in every respect yeah. these people themselves can't have sex so they go and watch other people have sex and so during all of these porno things it cuts to the audience and they're all like crying yeah or they're like or they're just sad or like desperately sad and, and they're all dressed as goths which i yeah. think at the time was like who's the most sad looking people yeah. we can think of yeah. let's just dress them as 80s goths yeah <laughs> but again metaphorically i just think this basically sums up porn right mm. it basically says and this is why it's so crazy that they managed to make this in the porn industry it basically says you it talks to the audience yeah. direct it's like you're watching porn which means that you're probably not having actual sex yeah. with a real person and again and I think at least is, not like this <laughs> and like, well, yeah but well i mean exactly like this it's not like yeah. they do anything that wild <laughs> I mean, it's mostly. Well, in this, I mean, in it's, this film, it's just missionary, isn't it? No, but I mean, I mean, they the the uh, presentation of these people is fucking weird. I think it's yeah, to show oh, like, oh, see, yeah, how outrageous well, they're like, yeah, and we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get to that. But I, but I suppose I just more mean like on in a metaphorical way. I just think that's such a genius idea. But yeah. also, it just fucks with the audience so much because again, the audience by default who are watching that film are a porno audience. Yeah. So it's tell it's just telling them it's saying you're a piece of shit for watching this film. Yeah, basically. Well, so I found a um, weirdly I found a uh, a paper written about his films specifically Cafe Flesh and uh, Night was it Night Dreams? Yeah. Um, and I can only get the abstract because I don't belong to any uh, university establishment, so I can't log in and see the whole. I, I of this. love the fact that you need credentials to read about Cafe Flesh. It's so shit. <laughs> but they um, they've written a bit about this. And they said both these films are notable for their novel approaches to sound and performance as well as their complicated relationship with the audience. In reviews of the films, one finds phrases such as the thinking person's porn film, suggesting their uncertain relationship to the porn genre. And indeed, both films feature idiosyncratic stylistic choices that are intended by the filmmakers to confound the generic expectations of the porn audience. Yeah. Which I think is a very intellectual way of stating exactly what you said. Like, everyone says... Well, I like to think that I stated intellectually as well. I think you said it way better. <laughs> but what I mean to say is, like, this is legit a studied thing about yeah. these films. Yeah, no, totally. Um, that they're, like, cleverly, you know, flipping a mirror onto the porn audience and saying, this is what you look like. And I think the other side of that is that uh, because it's pre- the way it's presented, so it is a st- it has a narrative story, um, which is sort of following these sex negatives and sex positives... Uh, but the story's not that important. But the interesting thing about it is that all the sex, obviously, therefore happens in a theatre. Yeah. So it's presented as like a sex show yeah. as well. So there's a there's a guy who is also in Dr. Caligari, who is the compare. Yes. And like he's basically spends his whole time, like prior to this, just taking the piss out of the audience yeah. in the film... But of course, it's just a close-up shot of him yeah. directly speaking to the actual real audience yeah. who are watching the film. Where he's, he, it starts. I think the whole film starts with him saying, "Hi, you little peepers." Like, yeah, <laughs> you know, just like this sort of like, and he just he just rails against them. He's just yeah. constantly like bad mouthing them. He's saying, "You can't get it up. You're useless. Yeah. You can't have sex. You can't have sex with these people. You're going to see these people have sex, but you're not capable of yeah. this." And all of this, and it's like I say, it's direct in that context. It's just one shot of one man berating talking, by berating what is in the film, the audience in the cafe. But obviously, it's actually the cinema or, yeah. or whoever's watching it, which I think is crazy. It's brilliant. But let's talk about some of the sex scenes. I think it's worth <laughs> listing them. Just to try and describe, to give you an idea. So let's just be clear about this. There is nothing sexy about this film whatsoever. No. Like, there is hardcore stuff in it, but there is no fucking way that anyone has ever watched this film and thought to themselves, oh, I'm, you know, this is a bit yeah. hot and sexy. Woo-hoo. Or maybe that man who got balloons. I don't really know. <laughs> so we'll just go through the scenes. The first one, three weird adult babies who have all got black face and vampire <laughs> teeth, dance with bones in the background while sitting in high chairs, whilst a man dressed as a rat sniffs a woman before having sex with her, and she starts wanking off his fake tail, and as he comes, the babies all start to smoke. He's also dressed as a milkman. 
He is dressed as a milkman. Like, it took me ages to yes, work out he what he was. He is. And he's got a fucking, like, prosthetic rat face. Yeah, it's like, to- um, yeah, he's a total, like, badly, yeah, badly yeah. rendered and it's, rat. And it's horrible. It's really weird and scary. And, like, ugly and so, horrible, And it's yeah. ugly as fuck. And he, there are close-up, just as it becomes hardcore, because it has this, in all the sex scenes, it has pretend sex where it's over the top and stupid. Yeah. And you think... Christ, is this going to be a real porn film? And then all of a sudden it turns into a porn film and you're like, okay, now they're having real sex. But this one specifically has loads of close-ups of him performing oral sex. Yeah. But with this fucking rat face on and there is absolutely zero things erotic about it. In fact, it's kind of painful to watch. It's unpleasant. And not not in a dodgy way, not in a sort of way that no one's... like. I'm not saying that the performers aren't being exploited any more than oh, what no, they no, must no. you know it's not it's not unpleasant in that way in the way that pro- you know a I mean, lot it's of probably quite degrading for that person as well, well like the yeah, guy yeah I mean, maybe he's wearing a rat face well yeah awful. maybe but i suppose he's probably agreed to it of course they have but i mean yeah. if you compare it to modern day porn yeah which uh, where in a lot of it an awful lot of it is based around exploitation yeah. and more or less like unpleasantness that has none of that in it no. Do you know what I mean? No one's doing anything horrible to each other. No, no, but no. But they are dressed as rats. And I would say, <laughs> right. like, the sex bit is literally... Yeah. It's literally what yeah. sex is, and yeah. it's finished now. It's like an afterthought. Yeah, it's uh, very yeah. much like, yeah. we better... I feel like, and this is... It's interesting that you said that the person who, you know, he was given some money... Is he given money by a porn person to make this? Like, yeah. this yeah. is essentially the porn industry that funds this. Yeah. And he goes... I'm going to make a film and I'll stick some porn in it. Yeah, basically. And so it's, yeah. very, like you say, yeah. it is the afterthought. It's like, these people are dressed up, they're doing a stupid thing. Right, quickly do the sex. Sometimes it's not even the people who are the actors and actresses yeah. that are doing it. They just quickly, you know, get some porn people in to do it. And it goes back to the story. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so the, the Milkman Rat, you know, uh, that's, yeah. that was horrible. Uh, the second one, there is a choreographed dance sequence between a man dressed as a big pencil <laughs> and a woman typing into an old typewriter. Uh, and whilst they're doing this dark secret <laughs> dance sequence, a girl in lingerie keeps putting a phone against her ear over and over again. And the woman who's typing at the typewriter keeps saying, do you want me to type a memo? <laughs> uh, over and over again. And then they, and then the big pencil and the woman in the lingerie start fucking. And whilst they're fucking, the woman continues to put the phone to her ear and take the phone away from her ear yeah. in, in rhythm with his penis. Yeah. It's uh, whilst the other woman keeps saying, "Do you want me to take a memo?" Do you want me to take a memo? And but then... she keeps saying it gets. I mean, and it's kind of weird, but like she says it faster and faster towards the climaxing <laughs> bit, and you're just like, "What the fuck is going on?" And then the third scene is some lesbians licking each other, um, which is relatively normal, except that the compare, his yes. name is Max. His head is in a cage yep. underneath them. And so he introduces it and he says some horrible things to the audience. And then they start uh, licking each other. And uh, that's relative. Yeah, well, so whilst this is going on. <laughs> no, and also a man laughing maniacally. Yeah. There's this. Re- the, the, suddenly. It's horrible. It's like the sound design just goes so fucking dark. Yeah. Like horror yeah like every horrible sound you could imagine. Yeah. And yeah, like this bomb siren starts. Well, going it's as off, if it's like. Because he says something like, uh, you guys can't get it up. So, the, like, something to the effect of these girls have worked out a way to do it all without you. Yeah. Um, just to be like, this isn't just lesbian porn. This is, fuck you, you're not even needed. Well, one porn. of the sex negatives says, torture's the one thing left I can feel. <laughs> when he's watching it. And then it's the probably the most straight up porn because all the others have the like weird dancing in, yeah. beforehand. Yeah. And then, so this one is like, Different in that it's going to be just straight up a porn scene from the beginning. But then, like you say, to change it up, you've got this man screaming at you in a box, maniacal laughter, bomb sirens going off. And it's like, here's a porn scene that you could probably enjoy from the beginning, except there's nothing. You're not going to be allowed to enjoy it because yeah. it's going to, you're going to get this overwhelming barrage of fucking horrible noise horrible yeah. noise yeah. that is just like I feel like I'm having a psychotic episode but I'm yeah. meant to be enjoying myself yeah, um, I'm, yeah I'm meant to, and this is supposed to get my penis this out. is meant to be amazing <laughs> but oh my god I can't concentrate on anything because I feel like I'm being assaulted yeah um, sonically um, so it was interesting I mean and then you know further assaults in the name of pornography yeah. um, that goes to the next scene where there are six arms sticking out of the ground who are clicking their fingers in time there's a naked woman in an upturned phone box 
There's this really like over the top like Art Deco set, which is really quite beautiful. Oh, actually, yeah. I mean, it looks amazing. It looks really nice. Again, it sort of starts and it appears to be a relatively normal sex scene. Yeah. Um, and everyone seems to be having a nice time. And then about halfway through, it pans up and the men, for some reason, have telephones on their faces. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. There's a lot of telephones in this, actually. I'm not really sure. Yeah, um, I don't know. And, so, and then there's a couple of scenes at the end, which I think was when he probably gave the people what they want a little bit, I suppose. Yeah, it was like, here's um, straight up porn. <laughs> uh, uh, but, I mean, it's just, it boggles the mind, this film. It really does. Yeah, it was definitely more of a, a movie than I anticipated, which I guess was the point of when we were watching it, because I, I, when you first said about this, it was like, I've watched this really fucking weird film, and this man made porn, so apparently this porn film's a bit weird as well. So I kind of went into it thinking, well, there'll be some story, but I didn't realise it'd be such a story, and it's yeah. really well told, yeah. much more narratively well told than uh, Dr. Caligari. Uh, yeah, I agree, yeah. By yeah. a long way. I would say slightly less... Well, the slightly premise less. is much better, but yeah. it's slightly less interestingly made, I think. Yeah, And it doesn't definitely. look quite as nice. Although oh, no. We, well, it doesn't look nice at all, but it does a very effective job of... Yeah. I mean, I don't know where they are. The setting of this cafe is crazy. There's like a big bank vault, which is yeah. the door that they're allowed in. And sometimes people will come to the door desperate to try and get in yeah. just so that they can see someone having sex because they don't remember what it's like and yeah. they like get kicked out because they're not classy enough and stuff. Yeah. It's, low, it's just it like... It is crazy. It's really dark. Um, one massively amazing thing about it is Michelle Bauer is in it. Yes. Um, who we... Have we talked about Hollywood Chainsaw? Yeah, so she, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we did. Reviewed we reviewed Hollywood. it, didn't we? Yeah, Good. Yeah, yeah. So she's the main actress from that. Um, and I remember we watched a documentary of the making of it and weirdly, she does reference having been in Cafe Flesh. And mm. I thought, I never knew what that was at the time. And obviously now I, I realise it is this. And she did ref, uh, refer to it as being a bit porny. Yeah, she's um, wicked. Uh, she has a porn scene, porn. but I'm fairly sure it's not really her bottom. I think she's got the stunt bottom. Um, and I would say, sorry, we missed this entirely, but Fox Harris, who was also in Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers, but more importantly is the guy in Repo Man that drives the weird yes. car. Yes. Uh, he, this was, uh, sorry, Dr. Caligari, I'm just going back yeah. to one because I forgot to mention it then. He, he's in that, that's his last film. And he is, Aww. I love him so he's much. He's hard to, he's very it. difficult to describe. He has such an unusual manner, such an unusual line delivery. He must have been a very strange man. In Dr. Caligari, he gets the libido of the really highly sexed woman in, uh, put into his forehead and he becomes a sort of, really overly sex lady yeah and he's he tries to have sex with his daughter daughter, uh, daughter-in-law or daughter every, uh, he's, oh, gets a bit weird. but he he just fucking i, I mean choose the scenery but in a beautiful way like yeah but yeah weirdly both so that that's from two different films but both those people are in uh, yeah. hollywood chainsaw hookers oh, that's um, fantastic um so another bit of information in this abstract is um about the kind of making of cafe flesh because it, it just made me think of it when you said about where the location was um this is quite literally about the location a tv crew turn up to like document the making of this film and god i wish that existed still. that definitely doesn't um and it says the news crew's presence on the set only added to the general atmosphere of controlled chaos the entire film had to be shot over the course of 11 days in a small studio in downtown la electricity was being illegal patched in to power the equipment the extras were recruited from a nearby blood bank and methadone clinic <laughs> oh they look uh, it as well yeah. I think that gives maybe I didn't realise that really gives that because that must be the audience yeah and they do look genuinely tortured people yeah fuck that's I just, amazing I mean it's sad for them but god that really makes the film effective yeah it's just it's just fucking brilliant um, so yeah I just thought they were just, that was just lovely little uh, tidbits to add on that's so wicked so then um, I mean prior to that he'd made these films Night Dreams mm. uh, of which the first one is quite famous I started watching we didn't watch Night Dreams no. for this. it's much more just like porn without a story so yeah. I didn't really see that there was much point because it's just making the same the same point really as Captain yeah. Flesh but I will mention this one scene that I clearly remember which <laughs> is a man dressed as a whipped cream box having sex with a woman whilst a man dressed as a ginormous piece of toast I think has sex with the other end of the woman, and um, <laughs> half sorry, but halfway through he suddenly starts playing the saxophone. <laughs> <laughs> I've got some stills from that, so uh, look that you yeah. know it'll be on the Instagram. And I mean, see. again, I think Night Dreams is available on Vimeo with that, with the porn cut out, but I think that's probably going to be less of a of an actual film. Really. Yeah. 
So I think that's probably about it. I, I, like <laughs> I say, you know, this was more of an idea of a podcast, which as it unraveled became less and less possible to actually do anything of any worth on. But um, I suppose I'm interested. To, I mean, what did you think overall of like the experience? Because we literally watched Cafe Flesh and Dr. Caligari one after the other yesterday. Yeah. What was your thoughts um, in conclusion? In conclusion... I wish there was more information available about the people that made these things. Uh, like you say, you've um, read Jerry Styles' thing, but I think it's Rin's dream that it's definitely the uh, artistic mm. um, visionary, if you can call it that. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> because all of his, so all of his work has that same look. Yeah. Whereas, uh, you know, all the other people come and go, but he's yeah. always consistent. I wish he'd done more. Is he still alive? Is that the he's point? alive. Okay. He's not even really that old, but like I said, no. he, he was very he's like 58, ill. And so I think I, I looked up. I, I'm guessing that he's probably, you know, I think, he's, I think he retired life. when he was in his probably 30s because yeah. he got really uh, unwell. Yeah. That's a shame. But yeah, artistically, I wish he could have made more things. Um, but if this is the only things he ever made, then cool. I remember the first five minutes of Dr. Caligari, I was like, what the fuck? fuck is going on <laughs> like i love this the woman who's acting and i say that in inverted commas because she is acting but she's being told to do this weird non-acting mm. we watched some i can't think there was something else we've watched recently where it's like these are actors but they're being told to act weird we have this, if, it's on the podcast we talked about this at some point um because it's com- it's comparable to something like a david lynch film yeah where people, are, people are yeah but it wasn't that yeah it we, wasn't i can't remember what else we watched recently but it's something where you're being told I know you can act, but act like this is fucking weird. Yeah. And the, yeah, like you say, these people are, are doing the same thing. It's very colourful. It's very jarring. Uh, it's almost like a play mm. in the way that it's kind of... Because the props are really... I don't want to say cardboard looking, but like in the first bit of the Dr. Caligari um, bit, the girl is like outside, sat on something and then kind of like walks over in a weird way to somewhere else and then goes through a door that isn't attached to anything and then comes out in a bathroom somewhere. Yeah. Um, and so it's all a bit, um, it's all very dramatic and dancey. I, I think mean, that's, it's very that's the choreographed. surrealist uh, element. Yeah. As well. But I, I mean, it was actually literally filmed. Um, so he talks about this in this very short interview, which is the only information I've got. Yeah. Um, it was actually all filmed on, on a stage. It is like a, it was. Yeah. Made like, and he said that there's loads of stuff where it looks like the camera's moving, but actually the camera isn't moving, the set's moving yes. and stuff like that. They did loads of weird, I think mostly just budgetary, uh, for budgetary yeah. reasons, but they did loads of stuff where they were using different weird ideas and stuff. And I think you can tell that but i think that adds to it it doesn't detract from it because it did it feels a bit like especially the first few scenes you look like you're watching something on a stage it does Mm. feel like that but i think that's really quite beautiful and pretty um and then yeah and then and then watching cafe flesh straight afterwards watching porn on an afternoon knowing that you're talking about it later (laughs) was a bit weird quite a lot of ejaculation um, There's but, so so much cum in such well, it's heavy, kind of all heavy it is. pubic nests. Yeah, <laughs> because so like many, a, there's so many pubes. Well, it's, it is <laughs> like you you lose nothing if you watch the one where there's no porn in it. You actually sure. really don't. So I was a bit worried. I, I, I we we sort of vaguely talked about it, but we just ended up watching the whole one because I thought it made more sense if we were actually going to do a podcast about yeah. it to get a full idea of it. But genuinely, if you watch the one without porn in it you would get the entire film yeah. just without the here's a close here's a close up with <laughs> yeah of a, of a dick yeah. like basically because and i would say like i i was like again not sure which bits we were going to lose but when you watch the film if you watch the full one you can tell exactly where story ends obligatory yeah. porn begins yeah. obligatory porn ends as you might imagine it would and then story continues mm. so I, I imagine that if you watch the one where there's no porn in it you miss Absolutely nothing other than some ejaculation scenes, uh, which is fine. You know, could have probably not seen six ejaculate scenes yesterday. <laughs> well, they were all very sane as well, I know. I mean, you do I... find yourself, like, longing for story to continue, which I'm fairly sure isn't what you're meant to feel in a porn film. Well, I think it which is, is what probably you're... what this porn film means that it's not really a porn film but i think it, but it I, I think it is how you're meant to feel in this film yeah and i think again i've already said this pretty much but 
that's why this film is so clever. Yeah, it's made it's it's a porn film like where you're desperate porn. for the porn to end. Yeah, and I suppose if you think we obviously came to it from a completely different perspective as what yeah. of what the viewer in 1986 or whatever would have gone to. Yeah, because if you think about it, in 1986 this would have been shown in grindhouses and sex. This cinemas. is uh, 82. I oh, 82. Think. Yeah, early, so early. I mean, so but I mean, it would have probably been shown for many years. But this is not. You know, porn was different. Yeah. There, it wasn't on video. It wasn't... No one was watching this in their house. They were going to a special place... Yeah. ...where people go, where, you know, poor old little Pee Wee Herman went once. Oh, poor to, Ruben! To, have a, to spend their money to spend an hour and a half where they are presumably hoping to have a wank. Yeah. And to be faced... With cafe <laughs> flesh, yeah. if you would, if you were just sort of like, oh, cafe flesh, this Ooh, is, that sounds it, nice. it's got quite a sexy cover. It's yeah. got a lady with her boobs half out on it. Yeah. It looks, it's a really beautiful cover actually. It, it's really nice. It's just like his style. Yeah, but you'd be like, here's my porn film that I'm going to go and see. Oh, pay got... me, pay me a couple of dollars. Yeah, you know, bring me tissues. Oh, I think I'm wanking to a pencil and I'm having air raid sirens and, blasted at me yeah. in a cinema. That would be horrible. Exactly. It would just be mind blowing. Yeah. Just it's kind of it's kind of a little bit like if you thought to yourself, Oh, I'll go and see this Gigi Allen. I've heard he's quite got quite catchy songs and then yeah. you turn up and he punches you in the face and oh. poos in your mouth. <laughs> and then you're just like, Oh, I thought I was just come to see a nice little, you know, <laughs> punch show. Yeah. With this musician, <laughs> yeah, no, I um, I had no idea what to think, and I still don't know that I know what I think. <laughs> but it was definitely it had a lot of artistic merit. That I think when you said there's this weird man who's made this weird horror film and also made porn, we're gonna watch some of his films. I wasn't sure how much artistic that merit very, was gonna be in there. Much more dictatorial than that. No, no, no. But <laughs> we are gonna no, watch not these porn are, films, no. Siobhan. <laughs> I didn't mean it to talk, but I think, but as in that was the description of it. So I was like, mm, I do not have any idea what to think and where the artistic merit would be. And there was so much more creativity and interesting things about it than I anticipated. Yeah. And yeah, I think people should definitely go and watch these films to have any idea of what we're talking about because yeah. I don't know if we can or have described it in any way <laughs> efficiently. Um, but it's definitely worth. Uh, watching we'll put some stills up on instagram to try and give you a uh yeah and (laughs) dr caligari is on youtube in its entirety which i will put on the playlist but i will say it's not a great version of it it's kind of like a bit it's it's a bit grainy and and the sound isn't that brilliant and the problem is the sound is kind of difficult anyway yeah so you've got to really concentrate if you watch the youtube version but it is available in two parts and i think it's like daily motion if you just google it there's loads of places you can watch however you would normally torrent Um, but i will know you do (laughs) yeah but i'll put it on the i'll put it on the youtube playlist and i think that there are like little stills and stuff I'm, i'm pretty sure this piece of toast playing a saxophone is on youtube so, oh, well, um, I've got a um, a gif, if that's what you call it. Uh, so I'll at least play that because um, he's doing a little jiggle and it's very nice. <laughs> shall we do a little jiggle to some uh, music? We shall. Uh, this band is called The Other Ones and the song is On Top of Me. Oh, which, um, I must say, I'm really sorry. Like Just let me apologise to yeah. The Other Ones because I'm sure this is not in any way... This is not a pornographic band. No. <laughs> Sorry, the other ones. We are just putting your song on top of me straight after our description of a porn That was film. not deliberate at all. I'm sorry. That's <laughs> In fairness, hilarious. Midwich Cuckoos did one called Sucker. So we really, We've, I don't know. All right, I'm sorry. I've We've totally, picked all the... <laughs> I totally curated this. I've been really clever. This was all deliberate. <laughs> oh, gosh, it's not going well. Right, okay. This band is the other ones. The song is on top of me. They are from London, and this song is from their self-titled album, which was released last year, and it's out on CD, and you can get it digitally. So this is The Other Ones with On Top of Me. I wake up every day Wish I could run away You say it's getting better Why do I feel the same?
trash is so sweet, sweet trash. To avoid painting, keep repeating. I love what I see. Leave the auditorium. It is only a movie. Only a movie. Only a movie. Only a movie. Uh, this week's decidedly non-trashy movie for review is The Decline of Western Civilization from 1981. That's stupid punk rock. I don't, you know, I just think of it as rock and roll because that's what it is. Suburban voodoo. Doug Simmons, the Boston Phoenix. My house smells just like a zoo. <laughs> The Decline documents a sociological phenomenon that is the foundation for the most shocking American youth movement in history. Spheres Films presents Fear, Black Flag, Circle Jerks, Germs, and X. See it in a theater where you can't get hurt. So for those who aren't aware of what this is, The Decline of Western Civilization is a documentary that was filmed through 79 and 80, and it's about the LA punk scene, uh, directed by Penelope Spheris? Shearus. Shearus. That's a nice name. Um, and basically, it's just a collection of footage of some of the bands that were going on in LA and some of the attendees to the, the scene, as it were. The documentary is very much cut and shut, just goes through the bands one by one, showing footage of them, footage of them talking, interviews. Um, and it's really very clever in as much as it's just straight up just being around these people that were considered quite unusual at the time. Well, I think as well, it was made at a time when these bands weren't nearly as popular as they became. Yeah. So uh, that's that's probably what it's most famous for, is that it's a documentary about almost all of the... Well, a few of them were sort of renowned to some extent. Yeah. But um, almost all of the bands got to be much bigger than when they recorded this. Yeah. Um, apart from probably one of them, really. Yeah. Uh, or two of them, probably. Um, it's like seeing them in their absolute, like... They're all, like, uh, late teens, early 20s, yeah. living in squats. Yeah. But some of them go on to be massive. It's amazing that there's footage of this little... It's just a little window into time. It's filmed over the course of, like, six months, yeah. more or less. And obviously there's loads of live footage, but I think it's I get, it's probably most famous for a lot of the sort of behind-the-scenes yeah. footage. And there's two other Decline of Western Civilizations, one of which we have talked about before, which is yeah, the second one. in the documentaries episode. Yeah, which is all about Cock Rock. Yeah. And that one is the middle uh, years. Absolutely unbelievable. Um, <laughs> and number three is made in I think nineteen ninety eight. Yeah. And it's much more like it goes back. It tries to do this again. Yeah. So it goes back to like the squat punk scene of L.A. at that time. And what they found was really that it was much a much sadder experience. Yeah. And there was a lot of people on drugs and people dying and all of this sort of stuff. And that is brilliant, I think, but it is a depressing watch. Yeah, <laughs> it's brilliant a documentary yeah. about a very sad yeah. situation. But I mean, I think Penelope Shearis is an amazing filmmaker. Prior to this, she'd made a film called Suburbia, which is almost like the exact same film as this, except it's not a documentary. Mm. So uh, that one's got Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers in it. This is the, it's the second Red Hot Chili Peppers reference of the episode, <laughs> which is a bit weird. But that's a brilliant film, uh, and that's all about sort of like squat punks, just sort of like their their problems with life. And she also made Wayne's World, most famously. There you go. Um, and she made a really brilliant film called Dudes as well, Dudes. Uh, which is better than it sounds, <laughs> um, and has more like a punk theme as well. But she's really got some skill as far as making a documentary is concerned i think this is obviously really low budget um i think mm. roger corman put up some of the money for it and so it was made like really 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 just like a grindhouse film yeah except that it was about basically probably i'm guessing all of your favorite bands yeah not you the listener, <laughs> the listener. <laughs> she's obviously got a way of just getting involved in people's world because yeah. like you say the behind the scenes bits are probably the most famous parts of this um so yeah we'll talk about each um, band in turn because that's pretty much what she does she yes. introduces each band one at a time um, at the beginning there's a shot of them all reading aloud to their audiences 
you know, you're going to be involved in this. Um, oh, they all, consent, yeah. and they all take it's, it in turns yeah. to be snotty and yeah, yeah. shitty they're about it. Wacky. That's the worst bit of the film. That is the to worst be honest. Bit. It literally starts bad, and then everything else is perfect. <laughs> Spoiler alert: This one's getting a high score. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, after that, it opens with some footage of an X concert. Concert, the band gig, X, the band yeah. X, um, and it just shows in the audience. The nicest thing about this is it shows tons of other people from other bands in the audience, yeah. and it's the beginning of showing off the ridiculous slam dancing yeah. that infiltrated yeah. the scene around this time. Yeah, um, and it's just people getting absolutely battered. It is really um, nice. For better how or there's, worse, it's really nice how there's like a load. Well, I suppose it's all the other characters who will then come up in the film. Yeah, but as but watching it from now, obviously you know who those characters are because yeah. they're famous. It's like Darby Crash is having a drink. In, yeah, Pat Smear's jumping about. Yeah, I think he's having a stretch at one point. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Claw Bessie falls over. Yeah, you know, there's just it's, it's really nice, and there's and one of the really lovely things, and this is throughout all of this footage, is that. Whilst the bands, you know, are filmed really well, yeah. there's loads and loads and loads of shots of just the crowd. Yeah. And I and, and also like the venue, some of the venues they play in are just these crazy places that you've heard about from yeah. early LA punk and stuff. And it's brilliant just to have a camera in there and it's great, a load of like them the don't crowd exist. shots. Yeah, no, well, so I think most of them don't exist, yeah. yeah the crowd cool. shots are some of the best stuff really. Yeah. Love it. Um so then the first band that gets a proper showing is Black Flag. Back when it, uh, who was the singer? He's called Ron, but I don't Ron know Ron Reyes is, um, the, is singing. He'd never recorded with them, but he's, well, he did record a horrible album with them about five years ago. Oh, dear. But, um, but yeah, he uh, is not the best Black Flag singer ever. I don't know how people feel in this respect, but Keith Morris had recently left. And so he, uh, some of the songs that he was singing were like the ones that were recorded with Keith Morris. And they just, yeah. he, he, he's fine. He's, there's nothing wrong with him. But yeah. Yeah, and he's obviously he really goes for it, and they are fucking brilliant. Like, yeah. Robbo is drumming for them at this point, who would later go on to be in the Misfits, and uh, it's the perfect era. But there isn't a bad era of Black Flag, but there's it's the perfect. This is era, a really but, good, yeah. yeah. Really cool. No, it is really cool. I love it. And then it goes uh, sort of to where they live, which is the church, <laughs> the which church. again is like this really famous place that if you've ever read anything about Black Flag or the LA punk scene, you know about the church. It's down on like the South Bay. They lived there, they practiced there. It was just kind of like this. It was literally, he used to be a church and well, now it's just sort of been turned over to the to the punks. And I love that the two, because two of them live there specifically and they're like, yeah, we can't afford rent and we can't actually, we can't live in regular places because we owe too much money to the gas and electric people. So Ron shows the cupboard in which he lives in yeah. because it's a lovely big room where they're actually staying. But he lives in a cupboard mm. and Robbo lives in the cupboard above his cupboard, yeah. Yeah. Um, which I had, fuck knows but how he actually gets in it. it's quite sad because Ron Reyes does this thing where he sort of tries to make it sound like he's a ladies' man in his cupboard. He's yeah. like, oh, I've got some panties in there. And yeah. I've got all of there. This is where all the action happens. And, it, and it, I think he's sort of being funny, but he's sort of not being funny. Yeah. Because then when he goes to Robbo's thing, he's sort of like, oh, there's no action up here or something and opens yeah. this cupboard. And it is literally just like the size of a human in a cupboard. Yeah. <laughs> But, but that's I mean that's literally how Black Flag lived and that's how they you know again it's we can't go into all of that I suppose at some point we should probably do an episode all about Black Flag it's such an interesting story but the you know the way that they did so much and toured so much and, yeah. and you know and they just lived this like this lifestyle which was unheard of really yeah. up, up to that point I'm sure there was a lot of bands after it that were that were doing it but you yeah. know they just put everything into their music everything was just about playing live and that, recording music that's yeah. what the um the person who's interviewing them kind of goes on to say like you know do you, you only pay 16 dollars to live here so what do you do with the money you make and he was like oh, we don't make money yeah he's yeah. just like every yeah. anything if we ever get any money it's to pay for us to eat some food and it goes straight back into promoting yeah. and yeah you do get that kind of behind the scenes of we live in a cupboard so that we can be in a band. Yeah, that person interviewing them is always Penelope Shearers, by the way. Yeah, so no, she's sorry, like really, I figured she's that. A really, she's really, and she's really good at enticing people to say things. Yeah. Uh, Chuck Dukowski is obviously very drunk, and he's sort of <laughs> trying to be... He is. He's a really incredible person, and he is really intelligent, but like he's trying to be really philosophical, but he's fucked. 
Oh, I love him really, in it. She though. does a really good job of just like trying to make him say stupid things, and he sort of does. He comes through. I think he comes through it. Like yeah. he still, he doesn't. I, I didn't lose respect for him, but yeah, he, he is. He is sort of a bit of a numbskull. No, I really enjoyed him in it when they were asking about why he cut his hair like that, and he's just like coming up with all these bullshit answers, yeah. and they, none of it makes any sense. But he's trying really hard to stay. Uh, worse still, I think it's the, at that exact point where directly behind his head, in massive words, as a bit of graffiti, it just says "surf muff." <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why I couldn't stop looking at that. I mean, he was talking like really seriously, and just behind, directly behind his Aww. head, he just says "surf muff," which just made me laugh. Well, moving on to other people who come off really intellectual, <laughs> uh, they then go to the germs yeah. to probably one of my favourite people who have ever existed in the world, <laughs> Darby Crash. Um, I don't think he is. You know, I think if you knew more about him, no, of think course, he was your favourite person. He's, in the world. he's problematic he is as wonderful. fuck. There's a uh, brilliant book uh, called Lexicon Devil, which the drummer from the Germs wrote with someone else, which is all about Darby Crash. And his life is really quite sad. I mean, he yeah. he really had a horrible life and uh, died when he was ridiculously young. But he was incredible. Yeah. And, you know, the Germs' first album is... I might actually be the best of that early punk album ever made, I think. Which is so unlikely. The first time I ever heard the Germs, and you'll realise why this is silly because you've seen the film, first time I ever heard the Germs was I bought, like, a record by them from someone who told me they were a punk band, and I was like, oh, brilliant. And it was a live recording... (laughs) And uh, the germs live are basically uh, just uh, someone going. Uh, so uh, the, the funniest <laughs> thing about this film is each band has some of their footage shown, and for at least one of the songs, they subtitle it. Yeah, and for most of it, you don't need it. Yeah, for the germs one, it's absolutely <laughs> fucking hysterical because they've put it there as if to say, "Believe me, there were words to this song." Yeah, yeah. and it's just Darby just going. Meh. But every now and again, he'll get one. That's yeah. the other thing. You almost become and you're like wishing him on to sort of just get. It's and every now and again, he gets a right word. Yeah, because like. it's impressive because it goes round a few times, and you're like, "Oh, cool, he does know where we are in the song." Yeah, um, but, I was trying. He's definitely. Oh, trying. Oh, I just, it's just, he's just wonderful. The best scene in this entire film, there's two of my favourite things about this film, and one of them is the scene of him cooking eggs with his girlfriend oh, in his kitchen. So he cooks them so that, bad. Oh, broken egg. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what is but going wi- on? But worse still, he puts some weird green stuff <gasps> on some toast. And yeah. I, I think it might be mint jelly. I thought That's it was the, mint jelly. The only thing I can think it is, but why you would put that on toast, I don't know. I mean, something to be said is that they're cooking food and they don't eat any of it. And no. I mean, that just... It doesn't look very edible. <laughs> he's too... He- well, no, I think he's got too much gear in him to eat yeah. food. I was like, why are we watching him cook eggs when he ain't going to eat? Anything. But brilliantly, on the second decline of Western civilization, they do the exact same scene, but it's with Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> <laughs> and he's worse. He's worse at cooking eggs. Yes, he's like exactly. forgetting where he is and stuff. <laughs> what doing? I think he puts his hand in the pan and stuff. <laughs> he he's like, it's just really bad. It's so beautiful. Everything about the germs part in this film is brilliant, apart from Darby's rat tail. Oh, Not a fan yeah, of yeah. his big rat tail. And he uh, spider walks all over him for a while. Oh yeah, he's a tarantula, but never mind. <laughs> Everything else, brilliant. Um, obviously Pat Smear is in it. He has a bit later where he talks about, I've punched loads of girls in the face, I don't like girls very much. And I thought, I don't really like you very much. <laughs> yeah, well, there's, there's a bit later on, maybe you've gone to it, so let's just jump to it. Yeah. There is a bit later on where, and again, I think she does a good job of making these people say stupid things, but they get a load of really young people, one of yeah. whom is Pat Smear, and they all say the stupidest fucking shit you yeah. can possibly imagine. And some of it is a bit dodgy, and some of it is a bit like, eh. Yeah. But, you know, most of them look like they could even be, like, I mean, just about teenagers. Oh, gosh, yeah, so, they I mean, are. They, they really do say some stupid things, but they're living in a time where, I mean, a lot of dodgy shit happens in yeah. this film. And I suppose it's probably indicative of the early 1980s and the early 1980s LA punk scene. Yeah. Definitely. Really uh, not you PC. Do, you do, yeah, you definitely have to sort of turn your ears off a little bit. Oh, gosh. Dar- but, I mean, um, Darby Crash says something that's a bit yeah. not okay when they find a dead person in their garden and yeah, how the yeah. police refer to him. Yeah. Not pleasant, but you've got to watch the film. I'm not going to repeat some of the, the bad things <laughs> no, that they say. We're not saying all the bad words. No, no, no. <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> We've already talked about porn. Fuck <laughs> So then the next bit, they go to uh, the Slash magazine headquarters uh, where they talk to some of the, probably the more regular people in it. Hmm. And then they speak to Kickboy Face, who yeah. is my favourite Frenchman who, I've ever met. Yeah, Claude Bessie, <laughs> who is known as Kickboy Face. He, <laughs> he is wonderful. Um, he's in this band, so they go from there to his band, which is yeah. called Catholic Discipline, who, to my knowledge, I don't really know if they recorded anything or what. I've never, yeah. I, I, I'd actually forgotten about them. I've obviously seen this film before, but I thought they were fucking brilliant. They are, like, well, they've got the songs them. Yeah, the 
songs that they play are brilliant and I really want to hear them but I feel like I probably would have thought that the last time I watched this film so I don't know if I've I don't well either I haven't or I've looked it up and they didn't ever record anything I'm not really sure they're playing the Hong Kong Garden which is um, an actual uh, Chinese restaurant that used to put punk gigs in and uh, again it's another place that's really famous for just being mentioned in every book you'll ever read about LA punk or whatever Uh, but it is fucking awesome inside it's, it's just beautiful. such a like tacky Chinese restaurant yeah. like, with a load of punks in it and this awesome band playing. <laughs> um, in uh, Catholic Discipline is this person called Frank, which is uh, with a P, H and C on the yeah. end. Frank went on to make like weird acoustic music, but also was in a load of calls like around. I read this book about like the death rock scene, oh, yeah. which came out of punk. Like, it was a later thing in L.A. And Frank played a big part in that, which kind of led to things like... And I don't think they ever made this type of music, but it sort of led to stuff like Christian Death. And, oh, OK. Uh, and uh, the Paisley Underground, like where people started making music mixed with uh, traditional types. And like there was a neo-rockabilly scene and stuff. Okay. It was all stuff that like came out of hardcore in L.A. Yeah. Um, and yeah, Frank was a big part, like continued making music. And I think possibly still makes music to this day. Oh, I like it. Um, Kick Boy Face, or Cla- is it Claude Bessie, did you say? Yeah, yeah. Cool. When they're uh, talking to him at the Slash magazine, they speak to him about whether he has enemies. And he goes, I should hope so, otherwise I'm wasting my fucking time. <laughs> and I just thought, I love you. Yeah. You're brilliant. He and has... then he sings a song about loving a Barbie girl, a yeah. uh, Barbie doll. So. That one's not as good. The first no. one's much better than that yeah. one. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, he's wicked. He's, he doesn't give a fuck. Like, literally, yeah. we should all be a bit more like him. Yeah. I mean, he also says some questionable things that you shouldn't say. But again, all yeah. the time. But he says them because he doesn't give a fuck. And in yeah. some respects, it still feels a little bit like, well, I suppose. <laughs> then, yeah. I'm not going to repeat any of them. Yeah, no, of course. If that's how you're going to go about life, then, you know. <laughs> you be you. You be you. You do you. You do you, <laughs> kick boy face. Um, so then we go back to X, and they are in their kitchen doing stick and poke tattoos on each other yeah. whilst X scene lies on the floor <laughs> yeah I mean they're, again they're all really drunk but they're being very over the top I mean I think they're uh, I think that looking back on X they were probably like hipsters <laughs> you know mm-hmm. I think if I'd been around at the time I'd have probably hated well because they were the band that everyone else got told they couldn't play places and they're the ones sitting there with roses from the whiskey a go go yeah. because well, they're they're enjoyed so much yeah I mean X were even in comparison to like Black Flag, although I think Black Flag are more remembered in the context of punk, X were the band who broke out of this scene. Yeah. Like in America, they were on a major label. They had singles. They, yeah. They, yeah, and they, they released great albums. The first one, Los Angeles, is fucking brilliant. Uh, yeah, it's like, again, like one of the best albums of its kind. Mm. But they went on to make like somewhat more poppy music. Oh, really? And they were much more mainstream. And X scene made like solo music afterwards and... She would later in the 90s join a band with uh, the bass player from Rancid. Oh! Um, they made an album on Lookout. I can't remember oh, what it's no. called. Oh, uh, it's all right. Auntie something. Okay. Um, it's all right. It's not too bad. But what I mean is they, they were definitely, like, even at this point, I think, they were already, like, I don't know if they'd signed to a major label yet, but they yeah. were on the cusp. They were a much more proper band. And like, I think their music's brilliant, but I think they're really quite dislikable. Uh, yeah, I bet I can imagine that they are. Especially, um, they have a funny way of talking about themselves that uh, I didn't, yeah. I didn't love. Yeah. Um, but that all being said, uh, I really, 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 really like them. I've written down best voices, heart <laughs> next to them. Oh, oh well, wow. because um, I don't <laughs> deep, know. Deep uh, oh, critical just, analysis. Yeah, I know there. it's bad. No, but I really <laughs> like their uh, voices. Oh no, totally. I mean, they were a brilliant band. There's no yeah. question about that whatsoever. Um, John Doe's written a couple of books. Uh, fairly recently yeah um under the black sun and something else and uh they are brilliant doc- documents of like early la punk the time, yeah. every single chapter is written by a different person and it kind of starts around about this time i would say and then um and then goes a bit forward and then they've released a second one which is way more about all of that stuff that came yeah. later like the neo rockabilly stuff and um they're both absolutely brilliant books i think he's great i think they're both great yeah, I just think that in hindsight, looking back on them, they were probably yeah. a little bit like egoy and a bit 
Also, we're not talking about the guitarist who called Billy Zoom. Is yeah, that what he's called? he's the most dislikable. He's uh, obviously dislikable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's just he's like outright trying to be a prick, but then when he yeah. plays, he looks the smiliest. <laughs> yeah, but even that, everything he does is annoying. Yeah. So he's he's one when they're being interviewed, he's like trying to be really too cool for everything. Yeah. But then when he's on stage, when he smiles like, like that, doofus. you just want to punch him in the yeah. face so bad. But, but um, I think I think he knows who he uh, again. I think a little bit like a. Kick boy, I think yeah. he knows yeah, who he is, and yeah, I think yeah. he's defiantly that. Cool little, for him. little tidbit: one of the people, or I think the person who's getting tattooed in the kitchen, and that is like the famous scene from *Decline of Western Civilization*, pretty much. Yeah, um, is this guy called Top Jimmy? Yeah, Top Jimmy's dead now. He died long, long time ago. He was on heroin as well, but he was like a sort of local legend who I'd never heard of, and I only found out from that uh, John Doe book. He did like soul, weird like soul covers and he had a really amazing voice. Aww. He sounded like sort of James Brown or something. But he was just Aww. this tubby white guy. Yeah. And he had a real, yeah, yeah, he had a real like difficult life and mm. was a real complete disaster of a human being. But every now and again he'd do these reviews and he was just like this guy that was beloved in LA Aww. but never got out and, uh, and then just died. Oh, well, at least he's in uh, this Yeah, I had no, no idea whatsoever. It's only Aww. that his name came up. I wouldn't have recognised him. I didn't know what he looked like or anything. But. I love it. Uh, then the next band we go to is Circle Jacks. Mm-hmm. And we can see a very young Keith Morris. Mm-hmm. Bless his cottons. Uh, they just do a really good performance in this. And yeah. he tells some people off for fighting. And I think it's brilliant. Yeah, there's not really much to it. They don't get interviewed, do they? But, no. Um, yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. you're right. I it's mean, fun. it is just literally Circle Jerks get caught at their absolute peak of how good they were ever going to be. Yeah. Keith Morris is his peak of how he's going to be. Yeah. I do get a bit confused because he's constantly holding a can of beer, which obviously isn't open, and they show him throughout <laughs> this gig, and he's always got this fucking beer in his <laughs> yeah. hand, and he's sort of holding it along with the microphone, and obviously he's running around and jumping around, and I just think, when he opens that, it's going to go fucking <laughs> everywhere. I mean, what is this? Oh, that's really funny. <laughs> I think there is an interesting story there because he had quite recently left Black Flag and they didn't get on with each other and obviously both of them are in this film. Yeah. And so I feel like it was either at that gig or at the gig that they filmed a Black Flag, which were different, that he was there. One of, At some point they met oh, up okay. uh, for the first time since. And I, th- I don't know oh, if they made well. up or not. Oh, okay. No, I think they ended up on good terms. But it was really... Like, Circle Jerks were really young. Yeah. At this, at this, um, at I mean, he looks like a, a schoolboy. I mean, yeah, I no, I mean, as in, yeah. Uh, nah. Oh, young in their creation. Yeah, 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 yeah I'm with you. Um, the one thing I do like about this uh, feature of Circle Jerks is that Keith Morris does not do a lot of talking in it. Because, his, <laughs> bless his cotton, his voice is quite notable. Um, <laughs> and I feel like he's in so many documentaries and you can hear him coming a mile off. And in yeah. this, it's just nice to see some performance. Uh, yeah. There's one point where he tells the audience off and I'm like oh there he is I can hear him now yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. bless him he's very adorable really then the second to last band is the Alice Bag Band who mm-hmm. appear and uh, it's just nice to just nice to see they don't talk uh, well, to them well no not really um, I, oh you so, don't well Alice Bag <laughs> is from The Bags yeah. and this was obviously like her solo thing I've read Alice Bag's autobiography oh, and no. I really found her dislikable oh. she's very sort of up herself and she seems to think that everything that ever happened was all based around Oh, really? I thought. It's been a while since I read it. That was what I walked away from it from. But I know it is a book that a lot of people like, so this that might be a bit unfair. But I will say, the bags were quite good, but they're not really, like... They wouldn't really be remembered that much, I don't think. Maybe that's a bit harsh. I mean, they definitely were around the scene and stuff, but they they wouldn't have been remembered that much. But the Alice Bag Band, I mean, every single band who play in this... The audience are going mental. Sometimes a bit too mental. Yeah. To be honest, but you know the audience absolutely fucking love them. There's not a minute where everyone isn't going mad. Yeah. When the Alice Bag Band are playing, they literally show the audience, and they all look bored to tears. Yeah. And their music is like they obviously. And I think I remember this was one of the things that annoyed me a little bit was that she did sort of want to become a pop star. Yeah. And she's very singy. Ob- yeah. This was obviously like an attempt to do that. But yeah. the worst thing about this, and I, I unfortunately found this out afterwards, so I, I know that this is a fact, is that, so they show them play two songs, yeah. one of which is really mid-paced and everyone looks fucking pissed off that they're even playing. Yeah. Then the second one starts mid-paced and it, the audience is the same, but then they kick in and it kind of becomes this fast punk song. They superimpose scenes from other bands' audiences 
over oh. the top of it to make it look like people go crazy. And you can tell when you watch it now. Don't get me wrong, people do dance a bit when they yeah. kick in and it becomes a punk song. But you can tell there's like, they show these people going fucking mental and then they show a, a shot from the back and it's like there's a few people moving oh, at no. the front. And then it shows them they're all going fucking mental again. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it was. I, d- I mean, she's cool and everything. Like, she's done cool things. and But she, I think she just wrote a book about her life where... Bit... She only did a little bit of music, really, uh, which is fine. But then, and but then the rest of it is just sort of filled up with her talking about how brilliant she is now. She's, yeah, that's Aww. how I remember the book, anyway. Oh dear! And well... I didn't like the band. I thought the band was rubbish. That was the worst musical performance in this whole thing. I <laughs> Didn't you think? I mean, I think well, it, it was... really stands out as being the worst. Yeah, no, it is. It is. It is obviously different and not as good. So there is that. It's a shame, especially to have come that late on in the film where you've seen so many good things, and you're like, oh, this is a bit underwhelming. Yeah. Well, <laughs> then it's the last band who shouldn't like as much. Definitely, <laughs> definitely after watching their footage in this, still really shouldn't like as much. Well, yeah. And yet, why they, am I so in love with this they, troubled, horrible, insultative to everyone, very obviously horrible to women in this? Um, yeah, I think that there's a, there's a discussion to be had about that scene. So, uh, yeah, so this is yeah, fear, fear. And fear basically managed to do and say everything wrong yeah. within about... Two minutes. And which was the whole... Before they even play a song. And it's their whole jam. Like, their, their point jam. is, we are here to insult you and yeah. how hilarious that you're then going to still watch us. And they encourage people to spit at them and they spit yeah. back at them. And their whole thing is kind of... Yeah, their whole thing... It's, it's a little bit like Café Flesh in a way. Yeah. Their whole thing is having a go at the audience. I mean, one of their songs and is called I Don't Care About You. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. the lyrics are fucking... <laughs> Brilliant. Horrible. <laughs> and I love it. Well, I love it so I much. Mean, there's that. There's also Let's Have a War. Let's, yeah. ha- let's Have a War so you can go die yeah. that's the first lyric <laughs> it's just so brilliant but yeah the first scene like like you said is uh about two minutes of just absolute chaos they haven't even played a song no. and the audience are going fucking mental well, and, they're and then them up, aren't they? yeah they're riling them up they're screaming at the audience the audience are spitting at them they're spitting at the audience yeah. um and then a girl gets on stage and just does kind of have a go at the band yeah. And I guess the band treat everyone as they would treat everyone and it, basically yeah. keep kicking this girl off the stage and she keeps getting back up on the stage and they keep punching her back into the audience. Yeah. And she Well and, and it's well not, after well once after that as well, it's not just her, is it? So she oh, gets up on the stage the and then and then other people start trying to govern and then yeah. it kind of ends up just being a really big melee big brawl, and it's difficult yeah. to see. But so I remember this from previous watches, I'm like because I've always had this thing, because I love Fear's music, yeah. I really, and I always have, but then I just have this thing in my head where I just remember him punching a woman in this yeah. film, and I'm just like, Uh-oh. my God, this guy's fucking dreadful. But, you know, but he's been in loads of films, and he's always really good in films, and I love his band, and I'm yeah. just sort of like, that doesn't, none of that makes it all right. I'm no. not making excuses. But I will say, watching it this time, thinking to myself, oh, God, I'm really not looking forward to that yeah. bit where Blue Ving punches a woman. He sort of does... Oh, God, are we defending... No, I'm not defending him at all, but I'm just describing that there was something about... So I suppose the thing is... Well, it depends. I'm not making excuses for him in any way, nor would I ever, at all. But the thing is that somebody... Like, let's ignore the gender even, but the gender's important, but ignoring the gender, somebody gets on stage and attacks him, and he pushes them off stage in a way that is like... You know when Bill Hicks does the bit about the country bumpkins telling him to come here? Yeah. And does the push. Come here. Come here. <laughs> yeah. It kind of is that sort of. So it's not really a punch. It's like a push, but it's a push with intent. And right? what I would say about this as a woman watching it is I was a bit like, girl, stop, stop going on stage well, and punching Lee Ving. Yeah, she keeps Because Lee Ving is she? going yeah. to punch you. Yeah. And you keep get and she she gets pushed off the stage tons of times and goes straight back at him like throwing her fists about yeah. and it must have been a weird time because you've just watched a whole two hours of every audience being fucking slam dancing and the people who are choosing not to be involved it was very normal to sit at the side of the stage yeah, yeah. so you could see the people that clearly didn't want to be involved and I'm not saying that scene is correct but there was a difference between if you were in the middle you got what you got your lot like you've accepted you're going to get punched and kicked about mm. so all the people that didn't want to be male and female sat on the side and this girl is at the front and so I feel a bit like and I'm not defending anyone here but I feel like she sort of knew or was expecting 
what she was going to get. Not what she was yeah, going to get as no, in get no, a punch from Lee. Yeah. But like... Uh, Punch from Lee. Punch from Lee, sorry. <laughs> my mate Lee. My, my mate Lee. Oh, I wish leaving was my mate. Hell, he's fucking punching women again. Oh, isn't Lee, he? talking about his beef <laughs> sausage. And um, so she's at the front. So I kind of feel like if that was me and I was stood at the front of an 80s hardcore punk show, I am prepared to be battered. Not that that makes it okay, no, battered no, as no, much no, as no. any other person no, no, stood no, no, there. No, no, totally, totally. And then if I decide I'm going to get on stage and this band that are insulting the audience and encouraging people to spit at them, well, not encouraging, but insulting them and, and riling them up and looking for a fight, if I then decide that I'm going to run on stage and bum rush the lead singer who's yeah. screaming at everyone, yeah. I'm probably going to get pushed off the stage, yeah. does not make it okay. I am not defending him. No, no, but no. I did see it from a point of view. I was like, oh, so I, I mean... That's probably going to happen. So it shouldn't it, have happened. I, I was but. sort of thinking about it as well from his point of view, and this is a... I shouldn't... I'm, I'm not making excuses, no. but in Los Angeles in 1980, yep. in the punk scene, these people were really fucked up. Yeah. And it was a dangerous place to oh, be. Oh, gotcha. And like, no, I don't think anyone's... Got, and so as somebody who was on stage, if someone comes at you to you attack you, f- yeah. you don't know... I'm not. No, I mean, I, I feel like I'm going to be making it. See, if I start saying things like she could have had a knife, but, but you she, don't but, know, you know who these I do are. sort of think. And obviously, don't get me wrong. Fear have brought this upon themselves. A hundred percent. He's obviously kind of a tough guy. He's a big guy, and they're desperately trying to get people to get riled up. And I yeah. imagine if they do this, I don't know if they just did it for the cameras, but if they do this at all of their shows, they must have gotten a lot of altercations yeah. with people. And people go there expecting to be in altercations yeah. with them. And so, again, none of this excuses it, but it's just, I, I suppose I only bring that up because that was, on this occasion, like I say, I was expecting it to just be this horrible yeah. bit where leaving for no reason just punches, punches this woman, girl. Yeah. And watching it this time, I was like, oh shit, actually, she attacked him. Yeah. And kept attacking him. Yeah. Well, yeah. But then the kept attacking him bit almost is less dramatic. The thing is, is that the first one where she just gets up on stage and goes to, I think, hit him sort of. Yeah. But I don't know. She's sort of flailing around. He does. That's when he's horrible. He's really horrible. Yeah. Because he's sort of like, he pushes her, but he pushes her in the neck. And it's really unpleasant. Yeah. But then from that point onwards, because it's a bit more of a melee, she's still trying to get up onto the stage. Yeah. But it's much more like they're shouting at each other yeah. and other people are involved. And then someone else starts having a fight and there's different yeah. fights and going on. And then something that happens when the footage starts is she spends the whole yeah, sat yeah. on the stage at the front. Yeah. Like it all kind of then peters out and she's obviously... I don't know. Well, whatever no, happens, then, it's but happened this, and now everyone carries on. Well, this doesn't make it all right in any way, shape no. or form. But the reality is, is that at that time, that's what people expected. Yeah. They all seem very calm. Like every, there's a bunch of fights in this. Yeah. And it seems like when the fights finish, it's just like, oh, well, we had a fight and now we're yeah. mates again. Like no one's like... No one seems very yeah, traumatised. I'm sure does. they're traumatised by their lives, which is why they're having fights of punctures. And that's what I mean. Like, she ran on stage No, Like, I'm not saying she deserved... That is not what I'm saying. But I do think she was expecting it. Yeah. And it obviously didn't, you know... The rest of the evening she sat and watched the band from the beginning. Yeah. From the front, even. Anyway, it makes for a very difficult start to a set of four songs or five uh, songs. I think it's three or four of their best songs. It, I mean, Fear... They're so good. Oh... <laughs> And this Removing is, the problematic, it's, it's so, but Fear it's so are probably, hard. probably one of the best punk bands of all time. Because they're all really talented musicians yeah. who have actually come from music backgrounds. Like, I read a bit about Lee Ving Ellie, and he's, like, a musician from, like, Day Dot. Yeah, yeah. And studied music and is a professional singer. And so... And you can tell. And the nuances yeah. to everything that they play is incredible. Yeah. So... It is very much a performance art piece to be that dislikable and fucking horrendous when the point of view is to be disliked and then be like, haha, you prats, you came and watched us. I'm encouraging you to spit at me. So you spitting at me doesn't make a shit's worth of difference. Yeah, yeah. And my song is about how you're a twat. Yeah, yeah. It's like a slightly clever musical version of what um, Gigi Allen was doing. Yeah. Except this is well, thought it's free, out. but I mean, it's a long yeah. time before as well. That's the other thing, isn't it? I mean, you could probably compare a bunch of these people to... You know, Gigi Allen was kind of the end of a long line. But, yeah. But yeah, I mean, definitely, like, Fear were the most... Yeah, antagonistic. Antagonistic, that's exactly the word I was looking uh, for, yeah. But the songs are so good. I, as a woman, probably shouldn't enjoy a song about how he's singing about his penis. His, his beef <laughs> as his <baloney>. beef baloney. <laughs> and yeah. how his girlfriend can't get enough. 
But Fuck Me isn't that one of the best songs of the ever but, did. Well, it's quite clever. The thing is, the words are quite clever because it's not fundamentally about his penis. It's literally about a beef bologna sandwich. <laughs> but of course it's not. But they do it in this sort of way where it's quite uh, it's quite witty. and It's just so funny. And then yeah. Let's Have a War. There's yeah. lines that, I mean, he's very homophobic throughout this entire thing. And I don't know if his violent J... Um, apology has happened yet but they have a weird relationship with homophobia because yeah. one of their way so again this depends on where you are in the world and at what time you're in that place because one of their things where they were being antagonistic to the audience was they were saying oh we're all gay yeah and it's that like was kind of that was thing. kind of their whole thing yeah so yeah. i don't want to say because they may well have been massive homophobes i mean probably most people were in 19 yeah. yeah and there was there's a lot of homophobic things that a lot of these people say but i do so i don't know i don't know where that well, leaves you there's no there's no conclusion to that statement yeah. but it's just that one of the things they do is they take an audience which is made presumably of homophobes and they say oh we're Use all it. gay yeah if you don't if you don't like gay people spit at us and yeah. this sort of stuff yeah and they kept saying we're from frisco yeah as i if, don't really like, know what that means but i, I think, think it's that meant to probably, be san francisco yeah probably I think. yeah I don't know. Yeah, I no, wrong, probably. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I thought but, it was like a place in LA, but I've, never, I've be. never worked it out. There's a bit in the Let's Have a War where they say, let's give guns to the queers. Yeah. And I feel well, like. Well, that's a confusing That line, could be so it? many yeah. things. That yeah, could be yeah. like, actually, that's fucking brilliant. Yeah. Or if, I know my audience will be annoyed by that. Yeah. So I've said it. I, I think um, that if you I think about know. it, if there was a song from this year that had the line, give guns to the queers. It'd be it fucking would, pro as well. You, yeah, you know who would be singing it. It, yeah. wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be leaving. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, I mean, that's where, you know, that's the problem. But, I mean, fe- yeah, we have this guy. I mean, fear is going again. I don't think I, they ever really properly split up. I've like. seen some footage of him. Um, him and Pat Smear and Dave Grohl all did a performance together. I think Dave Grohl was just getting, dragging people out to do songs. And I must say... Leave it was fucking amazing. He's seventy one. Yeah. yeah, and he looks he's going to be seventy two in he April. He looks like an he looks like an elderly man, but an elderly man that still has the exact same voice, and they still and play at that speed. I mean, the the, the spe- if you listen to Fear's recordings, I mean, and live, obviously, yeah. but if you listen closely to their recordings, it's almost inhuman it's how, an cause it, because not only are they playing quite complicated, complicated, no, it is, but it relatively complicated music. It's like they're bluesy, playing, so it's very like fiddly. Yeah, and they're playing it at a speed which is. I would say Thrash. not many people. Yeah, not many people could do it. Yeah. I really, even today, even like proper muso people, I think would have yeah. difficulty actually actually playing what they used to play, I think or brilliant. do play and still play. And like I say, he's a, like you say, he's a seventy-one-year-old man, and this and I've seen the footage of them live, and they're still yeah. they sound exactly the fucking same. They're so I don't good. know how. Oh, I don't know more to them. So yeah, difficult to acknowledge that you enjoy them. But well, the um, best band on this documentary by a country yeah. mile. He <laughs> says, "Eat my fuck, asshole!" to the audience, and I've put a heart next to it <laughs> on my nose. Another, some more, some more deep critique <laughs> there from Jules. I don't know. So. I just, I just. Oh, he's too charming in the way a psychopath's charming. I'm sure he's an asshole in real life, but I just adore him. But yeah, he went on to be in loads of movies. Uh, like we said, he's, uh, in, he's Clue, in Clue, isn't he? Yeah, yeah he's in um, Streets on Fire. Apparently he's in Flashdance. Yeah, I need to rewatch he that. He had a proper like uh, career as an actor, uh, you know, in Hollywood, and he, I think he's in a lot of like random. He plays like tough guys in yeah. loads of things. He plays someone in a uh, Netflix thing we watched not that long ago, where someone breaks into a house. Um, gosh, I can't remember what it's called. It's really brilliant. Um, it's got Toby Maguire in it. Fuck, I can't remember anything else about it. <laughs> anyway, yes. moving. Very good. He's got a Wikipedia Toby page. Toby Maguire that I'm project. Sure I could look at. I think it's no, maybe ago. it's not Tim Maguire. All right, cool. That Leaving boy that's in no, nah, that boy that's in Sin City, who's, who's little, who's not not Spider Man. Elijah Woods. Yes, Elijah Woods project. Yeah, well, he's ago. in something. Yeah. It's all very good. Anyway, leaving. He's wonderful, <laughs> wonderful man. Uh, maybe. <laughs> so I don't really know if we can. Um, oh, we'll ten. Give out this 10. a score. You say ten out of ten. 10 I mean, it's 10. hard to compare it to all the films that we normally do. I'm going to give it a nine point five because it's still not Return of the Living Dead, but it is a perfect film. It's probably one of the best music documentaries or punk documentaries, yeah, uh, ever made. But um, not necessarily because it's the best quality one, but just because, like we said, it catches this certain place, yeah. this certain time, and um, it's just. I think it's just it's just a wonderful capture. If you've not seen it, and I can't believe many people have not seen it, but if you've not seen it, you're in for it. You have to watch it. It's 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 such a good. It's it's a a perfect showing of how punk is not anymore for all of the good and the bad. Yeah, like it shows the most the bands that you love being the most difficult 
and being really not okay but then also showing a, a live scene that just could not exist anymore. Yeah. For better or worse. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, just yeah, the yeah, energy exactly right. is completely not there. Well, I mean, you don't have to... Be, yeah, you have to You have to accept it for being a film that was made in 1980. Yeah. Like, it can't compare to 2022. Yeah. And I don't mean to be, like, one of those punks that are like, oh, no punk is like it was. Like, because the thing that exists in this film just does not... And again, for better or worse, but it could not exist. exist. But I mean, not, yeah. We're at a point now where we're almost two generations past these people. Yeah, you know, and so that's how much things have changed, and that's great. It's good that it's yeah, changed. no, it is but good. It's, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad that it was like that then. No, I mean, exactly. some I things good... about it were definitely bad. Ooh. Don't get me wrong. But I mean, I know, don't think can, any band comes out both, PC. Yeah, 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 but you can accept both. This yeah. this is what used to exist in yeah. punk. Well, now punk isn't like that anymore. Yeah, exactly. And both of both of who's going to make who's going to make the documentary about nowadays. I want to see it. Well, we could make one about the next band, which who we're going to play. Oh, we couldn't at all. I don't know anything about them. <laughs> <laughs> but they could be in it as a uh, band of today. Yes, this is a band called Mass Lines, who are from Kent. And uh, we caught Mass Lines at the Lady Luck in Canterbury. Yes, we did. Where they played with Comeback Clip and um, Barracks, Barracks and Crash Mats and O to Sleep. And uh, I think they've been going for a little while. And I was um, horrified to find that I've, they're brilliant and I've never heard of them. They're amazing. I think I should have heard of them, really. They were yeah. excellent live. And uh, this uh, song is from a digital single that they released last year. I think they're recording new stuff at the moment. And they've also got an album out, which we got on vinyl, which is fucking great. Yeah. Uh, so this is Mass Lines with Lame Apprentice, Hopeless Master. <laughs> So that is everything for this episode of Breakfast Punks Podcast. Thank you as ever for giving us a listen. I hope you've enjoyed it and it hasn't been too weird. We <laughs> did it sort of the wrong way round than what we normally do this time and I hope no one was offended by the pornography. <laughs> <laughs> 
If you were, please email us because, as Claude Bessie once said, if I'm not upsetting people, they can go and fuck off or whatever, <laughs> whatever, yeah. whatever it was he quote said. Quote unquote. I can't remember. Um, you can email us at shamcityroasters at gmail.com. Uh, you can contact us via Instagram, which is at Breakfast Punks Podcast. Also, we now have a Patreon. Uh, we've just released our third, third. exclusive Patreon episode. Whoop, whoop. These are kind of like an hour long chats about various things yeah, on the last one we we aim to talk about funny books but we end up talking about more or less the meaning of life um, and whether we culture. counterculture whether we actually exist or not yeah we it really, went down a bit of a hole we really went down a hole but we're not going to give too much away because no. it's for our patreons only so Indeed. if you'd like to do that so you sign, are more than welcome to support us yeah if you sign up for three pounds or more then you'll get that and we're also sort of still trying to work out exactly other the things that we can give you yeah i know patreon. we Again, haven't quite worked out i feel like uh, our patrons aren't very greedy i mean tell us what you want and we'll try to do it farts in jars not doing martin appleby asked for that once and said no oh okay um, what to sell them because well, of yeah. that woman that did a fart in a jar yeah he said them. is that a patreon thing and i was like oh, probably not <laughs> well, <I don't> know. <laughs> but maybe, maybe for you we'll, maybe you're we'll only around the do, corner we'll do an even like <laughs> That'll, that'll be beyond like a £30 paywall. There's it? going to be a paywall for that one, for sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, so if you would like to support us, we'd really appreciate it. We put shitloads of work into this podcast and we are very happy for you to listen to it for free. There is absolutely no pressure, but any little that you could give us will help us improve yeah. the equipment that we use and maybe actually kind of try and advertise this thing because but social media is a load of fucking shit and yeah. what we post on Instagram gets seen by about four people. Yeah. Uh, with that in mind, if you would like to share us about or tell your friends about us or review us on whatever podcast app you are on or anything that you can think of. Anything you can do to help us. Please help us. We're begging you. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'll make a YouTube playlist for this episode like I always do which will be up on our YouTube channel which is also Breakfast Punks Podcast uh, so go and check that out if you would like I think that is everything Does that I like have everything? to tell you about before we go <laughs> <laughs> we will end with a final song this song is from Jason Sterling and the song is called I Fall this is from last year's EP Locked Doors and Lost Keys we've been meaning to play Jason for ages I think he's doing some new recording fairly soon mm -hmm. so please do listen out for that yeah he I think just played Hastings Fat Tuesday oh yeah I the saw one of his sets it was bloody good acoustic day which is actually tonight it is of the day that we are recording but not of the day that you'll be listening to this that's of no interest and also we're probably not going so, uh, <laughs> I will say that we're recording this on pancake day yeah. we are going to eat some delicious pancakes I, hope I would you encourage you all to as well obviously when you listen to this it will not be pancake day fuck that time is meaningless and made up imaginary I was going to say <laughs> yeah. um, and just eat pancakes eat pancakes every day what pancakes would you have if you could have any pancake Oh, I would have... Really quick, because we've got to go. I'd have a savoury one, which have loads would of you? onion in it for some reason. Oh. Like a cheese and onion -y one. Oh. Um, like and those be... crisps that pig likes. Oh, yeah, cheesy pig crisps. Um, <laughs> and then I would have one that had like some kind of apple pie filling. You go. Oh, mine is really boring. It's the ones that my mum made me once a year on this very day yep. throughout until I got to about probably a teenager, and then I started getting pretty good at flipping them. And Ooh. then I would make them for myself for a while. And so for probably about the first, apart from maybe the first couple because I was too little, yeah. probably the first 30 years of my life I had lemon and sugar on a pancake once a year on this very day. That's what you're going to be having. I've got and some lemon and sugar. that is what I'm having tonight and I yeah. can't wait. Loads of lemon, loads of sugar. Cannot stress how much lemon you're going to have. So much There's lemon. There's two lemons, they're all yours. Glorious. There you go. So on that note... <laughs> so anyway... <laughs> This is Jason Sterling with oh, I4. Oh, yeah, we already, <laughs> I know. We already We've already introduced it. I'm so sorry, Jason. We are completely fucking this up for you. Um, this song is beautiful. We are going to leave you so you can hear it. Uh, yeah, thanks, we'll, everyone. We'll see you in this two weeks. This is our goodbye. Time. And this is Jason Sterling with I4. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs> Like you gotta go it alone I roam from town to town And the hustle's all I know I have too many scars If not, I would gamble my soul If only it had any value Left for all the
the dead I owe. The snake eyes are always watching me. I stare back wide eyed and embrace their destiny. I play the games, cause the games are all I know. The gambling life and taking it all. Watch me as I fall. Watch me as I fall. Step I take towards the edge What badness awaits me next? 